yeah, first of all, I want to say thanks for coming on. More so than coming on, I want to say thanks for uh, being an awesome first supervisor because I, I wouldn't have been anywhere in my career if it wouldn't have been for you. I mean, the way you uh, mentored me and talked about the Rangers and just were so motivating, uh, I, I really honestly wouldn't have taken the path I did had it not been for you. So I just want to say thank you up front for that. I mean, I appreciate it. I'm probably getting more credit than I deserve, but thanks. <laughs> I mean, just you talking about, you know, your time of second bat and then first bat and, uh, you know, all that stuff was just very motivating and keeping us honest, you know, like making us, I, I don't, I've never done so many pushups in my <laughs> life than uh, I was your, one of your troops. So, uh, yeah, I appreciate it. I really do. Um, but yeah, thanks for coming on. And, uh, I figure we'll just, um, you know, go from the beginning, like what, prompted you to come in and you know you know what made you make that decision to come in the uh, air force well, yeah uh like i wrote in the stuff there you know i i came from a military family and so i grew yeah. up hearing about my father my grandfather and uncles you know i've had my grandfather was a marine in world war one my dad was in world war two and korea i had an uncle that was you know in the u.s army with the first infantry division did the whole d-day invasion on that side and you know listen to him yes. talk and and cousin that was in vietnam so pretty much through the whole the whole gamut and we even traced back having family members fight in the american revolutionary war the civil war we actually have a picture from the civil war of family members, one's in a Confederate uniform and one's in a, a Union uniform. Wow. <laughs> on, yeah, on, both on sides. Side. Yeah. <laughs> well, because my mom's side of the family came in through uh, the New England area. My dad's side of the family came in through Virginia and Georgia back in okay. the early 1700s. And then my side of the family on my dad's side migrated up to the Midwest, Indiana, Ohio, oh, Okay. That that, uh, that area on that side. So I know there's a lot of Ingrams in, you know, you see the names in the South, but I don't know any of them. When it, so. <laughs> okay. So growing up with that, uh, and I always wanted to join the military. And I, like I said, initially out of high school, semi pressured into going to college. And I got a football scholarship for a small two year college in California, went out there, did basically a semester play football going, I, okay. Besides playing football, I don't know why I want to do you know, I, well, yeah. I wanted to join the military and right, not right. so much. I didn't know what I wanted to do in the, uh, in school. So dropped out after that semester. Now, as far as picking the air force, honestly, the air force was my second to the last choice <laughs> right. coming in because the Navy was totally out. There was no way you're going to sure. get me on a, na a naval ship. So right, I actually, right. uh, went through the army. I was going to go army ranger. Okay. And. I was actually doing that still in California and I went to the MEP station, did all the stuff. And, I was like, and this was the early eighties and the military yeah. was hurting big time for people, you know, well, actually right, 1980 right. and I'm sitting there listening to the recruiters and the people they were allowing in, you know, cause they just had cubicles set up yeah. and you know, they're like, well, you know, you needed at least a 20% on the general to get in. You only scored 10%, but we got a 10% waiver. So I was hearing all sorts of crazy stories like that. And I'm like, yeah, you know what? I don't think so. I'm going to wait a bit. So, and then the uh, Marine Corps, but Marine Corps would not guarantee you any type of job. And I definitely right. wanted to come in with at least some idea of, of what I was going to do. So I went to the Air Force. And I actually had to go through like three recruiters because, you know, one thing I didn't want to, I said, I want to jump out of airplanes. And yeah. at that time they were pushing for people to be security policemen, things like that. Yeah. And so I you listen to one guy, he's like, no, nope, don't know anything about it. Go to another recruiter, ask him. He was like, no, the third one, he was like, hold on. I think I know. And he brought up, I think it was pararescue, uh, combat control and tech P. Okay. And I was like, okay, what does each one do? I was like, yeah, I'm not really a, into being a medic. And okay. at the time for combat control, you had to go air traffic control. I don't know if it's still that way or not, but you had to, to go and become a, a air traffic controller, or at least get through the first phase of their training. And then you could volunteer for combat control. And oh, okay. then, Tac P, they were saying, well, you can come in guaranteed at that time. So I chose that. So that's how I ended up 
in the career field. And to be honest with you, I was at Air Force basic training and I was like, oh, did I pick the wrong service? Because I don't know what it's like now, but I mean, it was, I mean, uh, we actually, it was a guy that did go air traffic controller and then he volunteered to go combat controller while in my basic training flight. And me and him both would get, not in bad trouble, but get yelled at for doing extra push-ups, sit-ups and stuff after lights, lights were out, trying try, right, right. Try, trying to stay in shape. So, yeah, so went in, uh, graduated, hung out, and then I came in right when they did the transition from people going to Keesler okay. and then uh, switching to Herbert Phil. So oh, I kind of okay. hung out in casual status for about a, two or three weeks, almost a month there at Lackland, wait for them to figure out orders. And, oh, okay. And get me down. So ended up going to Herbert Field, and we were the second class Falcon One to go through. So you know, we started that whole new program for yeah, that's yeah. what carried on for a while until more more the late, later changes came around. And so yeah, so I got you know all of us are like, ooh, I'm Falcon One, Eagle One, whatever. All right, right. <laughs> coming up and uh, got through that. That was a uh, I was glad once I got there and I was like, okay, maybe I did pick the right, the right job. Cause you know, we started like more of like what you were thinking you're going to be doing. Exactly. You know, it's like, okay, cool. You know, (laughs) I'm doing the right thing here. And you know, didn't see my blue uniform until graduation time. I think, I I, I think it was actually, I never even got to graduation because they messed up our start date for jump school. So the day of our graduation, they come running in the instructors <laughs> come running in they're like you got to get on the bus you got to get on it now so they hand us our beret hand us our diploma uh jimmy felton and myself were the two heading oh, okay. off to jump school and they throw us on a bus that stopped <laughs> at every little small town between sure. Fort Walton beach and benny <laughs> we got into benny like <laughs> two in the morning or something like that and had to be up oh, by four God. you know to, yeah. start, to start training so we actually him and i actually missed our uh graduation from a uh, uh, tech school because of that you know that was a start uh, i know one thing i i'd like to mention and, and you know for me you know a lot of our instructors were the romads from the vietnam era right i say at least half half of them were at that time at least the uh, tech sergeants and and above were were from that era and you know listen to those guys talk about because they would be like okay you get through the training and they're like all right, this is the way it is. This is the way it's yeah, going yeah. to be. So you kind of kind of had an idea about that. And I, one thing I remembered was uh, at that time, Tech Sergeant Billy Wells, instructor, he was, you know, one of these tall, lean, crew cut, you know, shape side. He actually got us out, took us down to, uh, during training. He would take some of us, if, if we were willing, we'd go down to Camp Rudder. Okay. The ranger school and link up with those guys and go out and watch jumps you know get on the birds watch the whole parachute you know air, airborne ops but one thing i always stuck with me he's like you know you guys are the new breed and i think for a yeah. lot of us that stuck with that transition from being strictly a romad to becoming tax mm-hmm. you know in that time right. frame because that's one thing we pushed and and pretty much for us I, at least for me, because I went to Shaw Air Force Base with my first assignment. And for those that don't know, in the early 80s, you basically, at the fort, you only had brigade guys and above. So you had brigade tac P's, division tac P's. All your battalion guys were either at Shaw Air Force Base or Davis Mountain Air Force Base. Oh, okay. At that time. It was still kind of set up from the Vietnam era, where, because guys were just coming and going. You weren't aligned to a particular division or army unit to support you know guys were deploying to vietnam coming back onesies and twosies so that's okay. how they kind of it was still set up it wasn't till mm, probably 83 i think 83 84 where they drew down that side of the uh, squadrons and took battalion guys and moved them out out to the forts oh okay at that time so Stayed pretty busy. I was only there. I think I actually I was looking. I know in your, your sheet you're like, uh, tell me about your assignments, and I'm like, uh, <laughs> a lot of. I don't think I was I even there a full year. 
Yeah. But during that time I was there, you were just totally TDY all the time because they would basically post a list of training because uh, the uh, 21st Tech Layer Support Squad in there at Shaw, you supported all the Army units east of Mississippi. Oh, okay. And the DM had all of them west, west of Mississippi. So, oh, man, you know, yeah. So, you know, we were all aligned. Like, if you're jump qualified, you're aligned to support the 82nd in case something happened. But you could right. support any unit you wanted. So, you know, as a young airman, I would walk up and say, okay, I'm going on this one. I'll be back for two weeks. I'll go on this one back for two weeks. I'll go on this one back for two weeks. I just did that <laughs> pretty much up until I got orders to uh, Korea. Okay. Which was my second assignment. And uh, the one thing I could say for Korea at that time during the Cold War era, it was probably one of the best places to learn your job for, yeah. uh, especially for controlling air. Now you gotta understand this was before the whole ETAC program started, and but we were controlling air. They expected us to control air, okay. You know, whether you're E three or whoever, so you know there I would go out, oh at least weekly out to well at that time it was nightmare bombing range and yep. control live cast every week. Wow. Well, just out there controlling. And so I learned a lot about controlling cats. I figured up one time, I think I did about 300 controls in my time in Jeez. Korea during that time. Cause I mean, because I was always like, I'll go, I'll go, I'll yeah, go. Yeah. Right, <laughs> you know, right. Out there. Yeah, what else are you going to do? Yeah. Yeah. You know, while, while, well. while I was there. So I was, I was out there probably more than some of the others, but you know, a lot of guys, you got quite a bit of control. And then you add yeah, in yeah. all the, the dry cast that you did and stuff with uh, a lot of the rock and, I can only talk from my spec, but this may be somebody, you know, probably go more in depth, somebody like Mike Denny or Mark George off the top of my head. But, you know, at that time we had the combined TACP, mm-hmm. which is, you know, we supported the rock army. We were embedded just like guys were right, you know, right. embedded. And that was definitely interesting. And like I said, at <laughs> that time you got your mission readiness status and they didn't care if you were an E3 or not. They, they would, you showed up, Within the first week, you got your mission readiness check out, you got your check ride done. And then they would say, okay, you got this, this, and this next week. You got this, and this the following week. And you were just expecting Man. to do it on your own, whether or not. So that was great. Yeah, at, least, yeah. at least I did. I, th- I thought it was. And being embedded with battalion, because my boss, he kind of knew, I was like, oh, you're kind of who or some of the other guys. Well, we do have one one position up at a battalion on, on the DMZ that we haven't filled for quite a while. Do you want to do it? So I said, sure. So I actually course, got a yeah. chance to actually go up into the DMZ quite a bit. And on the Korean side, I never really made it to the American side sector. But yeah, on yeah. the Korean side, I mean, these guys were taking shots at each other almost daily. Really? But, oh, yeah. They'd be up there. Wow. I mean, first time I was up there, you hear pop. And then... <laughs> Either the south or the north would shoot first, and the south would go pop, north would go pop, then it was pop, pop, bang, 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 and they would open up machine guns. Really? Cruiser weapons, shooting a few rounds at each other, and maybe once in a while you would get like a mortar round, but once a mortar round was fired, they're, they're like, okay, it stops. Yeah, yeah. That's, <laughs> far, that's far enough. Yeah, yeah. as far as it would go, but that was, that was fair, fair, uh, fairly common. Wow, I had no idea. Yeah, common up there for that to happen. So, you know, like I wow. said, being the cool war time, I thought, well, okay, well, at least I'm getting a little bit of experience here. <laughs> right, you know, yeah. Hearing and seeing stuff whiz, whiz by, it, it was never anything massive. I don't think anybody ever got even hit. I don't know if they were even aiming at each other. They were just kind oh, of like okay. shooting, shooting back and forth just to, to say, hello, I'm still here. Yeah, you know, we're, 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 we're still here, but... So that was interesting being the only American and, you know, we were all ones at that time. We didn't go out yeah. in a big group. So part of me is like great training and learning it, you know, working with a different country and their military. Well, I was glad nothing ever happened because, you know, you're it. You, you, I mean, you're, you're the, the only thing you had was you and your radio to talk to anybody else that was an American. Yeah. Like, did you, did you feel like if something would have happened that they could have done, you know, they would have been uh, a force to be reckoned with, or was it like they were just going to get run over? Or did you feel vulnerable being with those guys or were, were they okay? Were no, they, they were good. They're, they're military. I didn't have a problem with, and 
you know, the main reason we were with them at that time, we had Korean ALOs supposedly okay. with us. But at that time, it was pretty much like, you know, a, you know, Lieutenant Captain so-and-so, you know, of the Rock Air Force, you're, oh, you're going to go be an ALO. And they're like, huh, what, what? And, <laughs> and that's where really the, you know, a lot of the, uh, the, the push started in Korea for the enlisted guys to get certified to control because okay. everybody knew. You know, our uh, suffix was, you know, wherever our call sign was, was Tango. And almost every time when the, uh, air, if an Airfax showed up, we had OB-10 Broncos at that time, okay. Airfax, they would always go put Tango on. Oh, okay. Because I would say out of all the rock ALOs facts that I worked with, only maybe two spoke decent enough English to actually control a mission. Yeah, okay. So, and a lot of them at that time, they had pre filled out nine lines oh, okay. and they would go, you know, we would go out with they them. They're like, it. okay, we're going to, you know, stop here and we're going to hit that bridge right here. And they would just read straight off the nine line. And if the pilot came back with any questions, they would just turn, look at you, hand you the mic. <laughs> and then, you know, you fill them in on anything else that, that, that they yeah, needed yeah. to know. So Korea was a good, a good place for me to learn the job. And I think for most of the guys would probably agree with that. I, I don't know what it's like now over there. I haven't been back there since 86. I think, Oh no, I take that back. I actually went and saw my wife there in 80 or 98. I think it was oh, okay. when, 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 when she was stationed there, but I haven't been back, you know, working there. So I'm not really sure how, how it's all set up. And yeah, I mean, neither I haven't the been there and stuff stuff goes but yeah, it, it was a good assignment and one thing good about it and the only reason i went to korea because there was a big push in the career field at the time it's like well all the airborne guys never have to do korea yeah so my name came up i through my whole career i think my name was in red for his assignment because i think i only <laughs> averaged just shy of three years per per assignment yeah. for my time in so my name popped up and that's the reason i i ended up going to korea but in the long run i think it was probably the best thing, you know, things happen for, for a reason, because with that, I was like, and they're like, well, you could probably get out of it if you want, you know, we can probably get you out. And I was like, well, what are my options? And they're like, well, if you go, but understand if you go, you get it, you know, normally you're going to get your first choice on assignment. So I was like, right, right. well, I want to go to the Ranger guy. And they're like, well, let's see what we got. And they're like, well, we can get you up to uh, Port Lewis to support second ranger bat and i was like okay send, send me to korea and so nice. that's how i ended up getting to the ranger tac p at that time okay and uh so i ended up at fort lewis this was uh see i was in korea in 82 to 83 so i got the lewis the end of august of 83. so i basically got to the ranger time about the time grenada kicked off i was only right. there may, may, maybe a month when when that happened but at least I got eh, a month in. And you got to understand, at that time, as far as supporting the Rangers, they were like, hey, if you're willing to support them, we'll take you. Because I was still yeah, a, yeah. I, I was still in the E3 at that time. Oh, really? But, yeah, when I showed up. And actually, we were <laughs> wow. all E3s for the most part. Jeez. At least, well, there was only two enlisted billets with the Rangers yeah. at second bat. I think first Ranger bats had, no, no, it, it was still two two there too also so there was two enlisted billets and normally when i got there one uh you know usually one of us was an e3 the other one was probably an e4 buck sergeant at that time when they still had the buck sergeant rank right making staff sergeant some, some somewhere in there so when i got there because when i got there it was uh myself and jeff stahl okay and uh jeff ended up cross training he got his commission and cross trained over into combat control Right, right. In his time there. But it was myself and Jeff Stahl, and then we had two captains for our ALOs. Okay. At, at that time. So when Grenada, they're about, about a month, month and a half, somewhere around there, was it the end of October, I think Grenada happened. And uh, that's where I was like, well, who, 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 who gets to go? Because technically, when Grenada, we got the warning order, we got called in, I don't know, one o'clock in the morning, got a call, sitting in my apartment or sleeping in my apartment, hey, come in. Yeah, yeah. So we all come in and that was normal because the battalion commander we had at the time, Colonel Hagler, 
he thought the way for a ranger to start his weekends was to do a 12 mile ruck march. So normally every Saturday, <laughs> oh every Saturday morning around two, three o'clock, we would get recalled in, do a 12 mile ruck march and then say, have a good weekend. <laughs> so we were basically thinking, yeah, same thing, but we showed up and we're like, all right, this isn't, this is not the same. They're actually being nice. You know, everybody's being nice to everybody. Because they're yeah, like, well, if you forgot anything, go back and get it. You know, make sure you have have all your stuff. And you see them taking clocks off the walls. Uh, and I'm definitely dating myself. They're opening up the uh, the receiver and speaker on the old telephone. The phones, yeah. And pulling out the little carbon <laughs> thing, <laughs> setting them outside so nobody can make a telephone call. And, you know, they're just packing up everything. And, yeah, yeah. you know, we're sitting there going, uh, what's going on? And, and at that time, I think Beirut just happened the okay. bombing in beirut so a lot of us thought we were heading to beirut but we got told well we're going you're we're going to grenada and everybody's like grenada grenada and kind of like in the yeah. clean eastwood movie heartbreaker <laughs> we're all like grabbing globes and finding maps going Where's, <laughs> I, I think it's in south america you know it's a country and we're like no it's an island an island you know, we, we didn't really know what, what was going on yeah, yeah uh deployed out uh we actually went to hunter army airfield and at the time you know, there wasn't regiment, there wasn't third, third, third battalion. You just had mm -hmm. first battalion and second battalion. And each battalion was an independent battalion falling underneath the army's uh, JSOC. And one of us was always on alert. One of the battalions were always on alert. And actually second battalion was on alert, but everybody's like, we want a piece of the pie. So sure. when we showed up there, they decided to take half of first battalion and half of second battalion. Okay. And I'm not sure how first battalion did it, but second battalion said, okay, we're only taking E5s and above. <laughs> so, I mean, and this is why, you know, it was sheer American military guys going, I got a mission to do to get the job done. That's how Grenada got done because it was right. not coordinated very well. So when that came up, you know, initially they were only going to send the two ALOs were going to jump in from second bat. And the other captain just showed up and they were telling me, he's like, well, Keith, you know, we really don't know. You haven't been checked out. We, you know, and I go, well, what about him? I go, he just showed up. Yeah. So we made the decision that Jeff Staha would go and Captain Grothaus, the senior ALO would end up being the one. Th those were the two that actually end up jumping in. And to be honest with you, I was still, still this day, I'm still like, you know, I think we should have held our feet to the fire and sent all of us in, but sure. you know, it's, it's, it's water underneath, underneath the bridge. Yeah, yeah. So basically I became, I think I wrote on the, the one man, a, a sock. Oh, right. Okay. <laughs> so basically as an E3 sitting back, we were receiving SATCOM and back then SATCOMs were in like our Mark 206 pallets. They were huge yeah. systems. So, right. the, so the Rangers had their own radio system, kind of like a we had so basically i during that time frame i would get basically the ato down get the information through satcom down to the guys on the ground and that's pretty much what i did the whole time okay down there yeah, i had no idea that I, I i just thought they jumped in and they were kind of isolated and i didn't even know they had like a a rear uh like a detachment or so you know yeah the uh doing that kind of stuff that's awesome yeah yeah pretty much that was right because like I said, when they went half battalions, so basically you had company commanders becoming platoon leaders. Right, right. You had a bunch of headquarters majors and stuff becoming company commanders. <laughs> yeah. You know, you had, you know, except for some of the specialty stuff like the mortar guys, you know, if they were E3s, E4s, they were going. But so basically, you know, you basically took everybody down. Platoon sergeants were now squad leaders. You know, yeah, platoon yeah. leaders were now, you know, and down. So it was. They probably loved it. They were probably like, hell yeah. control they're... wasn't the best in the world. Let's just put oh, it okay. that way. <laughs> when it happened. And uh, and you could, you know, talk to the guys like uh, Robert Scott, and those guys that actually jumped in. But, you know, talking to Jeff, you know, those guys, I think they de-rigged and rigged up in the bird like two times. Because they oh, couldn't really? decide whether they were going to land or jump. Oh, okay. Jump, you know, initially it was. Okay, we're, they're jumping in, and they're like, oh, no, we can air land. And it was like, oh, no, we can't air land. And these guys were rigging up. They had no water on the thing. They were passing around water 
in ammo cans. So guys were drinking water out of ammo cans, get the oh my God. Knife, and all, all this type of stuff before before they jumped in. But those guys can go go more more, more in detail of that. And you also got to realize at that time in the career field, nobody even knew any of us even deployed Air Force. Yeah, right. Command. And I remember them coming back and they're like, well, you weren't supposed to go. <laughs> and since they didn't know what was going on and somebody up at our hire was asking, well, who's on the ground? And they just went off of names of who we're supporting. And my name was on there, but nobody could find me in Grenada. Oh, uh, yeah. So I was reported as missing in action. Oh, my God. And they actually contacted my parents. Oh, really? On top of that. So when everything was done, all the guys came back, you know, they're like, we just called and my parents like crying. I'm like, why, why, why are you crying? They're like, well, we got a call saying you were missing in action. And oh, my God. Like, no, no, no. Don't don't <laughs> don't worry about that. And we ended up getting Jeez. that straightened out in the long yeah. run. And that kind of highlighted in the career field, because, you know. And you probably saw it a little bit. Well, you, your first time, you know, we we're all at Davis Monthan, but. You know, some of us, especially the smaller units, you were just kind of out there. You were yeah. detached from, from, from the Air Force. And the Air Force, were, to a certain degree, were detached from you. I mean, we had no groups yeah. at that time. You know, yeah. we just had a 06 and a couple of enlisted guys for the Corps, yeah, yeah. you know, at the fort. So, you know, that was one thing that was highlighted from, from Grenada is like, well, we got to get these guys a little bit more into the Air Force system. Sure. For knowledge of it, I don't. I don't know how many times we've come back from stuff, and the Air Force never even knew that we were gone. Well, we I guess it'd also be the nature of just the business of the Rangers. Like that, not everybody needs to know what the Rangers are doing per se. Yeah. So, you know, a lot of times it's like, yeah, I'll tell you when I get back. You know, I'll fill you yeah. in. But yeah, yeah, <laughs> that, that's what. But even our detachments, because we were actually at Fort Lewis, it was Detachment Six supporting the ninth id but the ranger guys there we were actually detachment six dash two if i if i remember correctly so we were kind okay. of separate from even the regular detachment we had our own little building in the compound but we were kind of off 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 by ourselves doing our own thing yeah, yeah. and on that side i used to actually get quite a few guys that showed up you know pcs in i'd be gone for six months whatever and come back and they're like, oh, the new guy. And I'm like, oh, no, I've been here for two and a half years. <laughs> yeah. And also during that time, because, you know, for the Ranger Tac P's, you know, we like I said, we just had the two officers and, and the two enlisted. So it was basically set up when I first got there that one officer, one enlisted would be at the main battalion talk and then the other one at the jump talk. Yeah. And that's how it was set up. And, you know, Grenada definitely highlighted the fact that we needed to get, you know, further down and out front. And it also, once again, highlighted the whole thing about getting enlisted guys tech, tech certified. Because, you know, once right, again, right. we're doing all this controlling in a combat environment down there. And, you know, none of us yeah, are yeah. technically, you know, certified to control air. I mean, I remember. Right, right. And, w and everybody knew we were doing it. I mean, my guys would send me off. I remember one time I went to Alaska. Yeah. And this is for JTAC, and I was up controlling A-10s, live missions, all by myself, and, you know, with some Army guys, and they're like, oh, yeah, he's fine. Just let him go. <laughs> you know, about there. But like you said, once again, I, I think I lucked out because between Korea and Fort or Shaw, because I had a lot of good uh, ALO officers I went out with that they would go out, control one mission, you know, get – check their box and they would just throw, throw the mic at you and say, okay, okay. the rest of them, the, the rest of them are yours. You're, you're yeah. That was real stuff. fortunate because you got that background before you even, yeah, yeah that's awesome. And, you know, and, and a lot of us, a lot of us were doing that at that time, but, uh, yeah. but like I said, so one of my main goals when I was at second Ranger bat was say, was let them know that it's like, yes, we can do this job. Cause I think I wrote in there, I told you, you know, initially it was like, well, what are we supposed to do with you guys? Yeah. You know, so if seating was limited on a chopper or whatever, you know, we were kind of like the first ones getting cut. Right. You know, which should and, be the opposite. You should be, yeah, they and, should be bumping their, another 11 Bravo or something for you guys. Yeah. And I, and I always tell people, I said, one of the, the best compliments I ever got was that I don't, I don't remember exactly what we were doing at the time, but it was like, no, 
I want Ingram on, on the bird, cut, cut somebody else. Nice. You know, so we finally showed them like, yes, we can do the job. And I mean, it got to the point that sometimes we had to back off because they're like, Hey, take point, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I know you can, you know, you use a compass and you can stay awake and do all this stuff. You can take point. And we're like, yeah, technically we shouldn't be out doing, doing yeah, right. the, the, being point on a, on, on a patrol because, you know, back then we were still doing a lot of uh, cold war type training scenarios where the range battalion goes in behind enemy lines and just does raids and ambushes and that type of stuff. So a lot of our stuff yeah. was, you know, in the field for, you know, eh, 10, 15, 20 days doing patrolling type stuff out there. And a lot of guys get tired. I think I, on one of your other interviews, they were talking about giving guys, you know, stuff to keep you awake. And, uh, yeah. you know, for us, it was camera. I don't even know what it was actually the actual medical name. We call it camp camera candy. It was basically caffeine. It was a Motrin laced with caffeine. Okay. And it was a pill about, <laughs> it, was, it was a horse pill about that big. Yeah. It was, I remember there were orange and, and white and you're only supposed to take one every 12 hours. I think is what it yeah. said. Well, the medics would give us the, uh, the pharmacy bottles about that big oh and we just throw them in a rock and some guys, would like every hour oh my God. just just you know kill the pain and, and keep you awake so you know yeah, we, did, yeah. we had a lot of that <laughs> on it. i one every 12 hours or so was 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 plenty for me because yeah the, the things were pretty big but i don't think it was like some of the other stuff like i said it was just motrin and caffeine that was, yeah, that yeah. was laced in it but but so yeah so we actually to a point we had to start kind of backing off a little bit saying no we you know we can't be point we, you know you know, we're here for a special purpose and our mission, right. this is our mission on that side. But at least open that door where after that, you know, they expect us to be there. They expected us, you know, to be there to, to control the air. Cause, and a lot of, and other thing is for the most part, these guys, it was AC-130 or nothing. Mm -hmm. And we kind of showed them what fast movers and bombs and stuff can actually you know, do, do, do for them also. So they're like, Oh, Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Let's, let's try to schedule and get, you know, get, get other aircraft on the bird. So yeah. that was a big one for me. And like I said, not too long after that, we deployed down to central America and I was actually with a platoon that went in there and this was, you know, the eighties. And I know I was looking up some stuff. There's actually an advocacy group. We're still trying to get, the government to recognize what the guys were doing down there back back in the mid 80s okay because technically it's still just a training mission oh, okay down there but <laughs> i know when i jumped in we were jumping in as a platoon they basically had us jump in and then everybody else was kind of spread out different companies and stuff were spread out and we were jumping in closest to 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 the border uh that, down there with uh, nicaragua you know, as we're coming down, we started hearing, you can hear it, like pop, 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 pop. Really? Yeah. And we actually went in with live live ammo, just in case. Yeah. In, yeah. NCOs and above. And our plane got delayed, or our TOT got delayed. And I still remember, because we were actually going in at 800 feet on that drop. And, yeah. well, 800 feet for us wasn't really a big deal. Because kind of when I first came yeah. in, 800 feet was the standard. Right. For because the T ten yeah. was like uh Yeah. Yeah, that was about that was a standard. But the pilots and stuff didn't take in consideration that the drop zone, the leading edge was here and the trailing edge went up like this. So <laughs> oh, no. for a lot of us, I do remember I jumped out and I'm like, Man, those trees look big. And I had about <laughs> I don't know, two or three twists. And by the time I got those out, I went down to lower my rucksack and I just plowed. Oh, and man. after the whole thing was done, they said, yeah, some of you guys probably went out around 450 feet. Oh, my God. <laughs> you know, some, oh, somewhere man. around. We kind of we kind of forgot about the whole <laughs> incline, and we just flew flew straight and steady. Because I still, even to this day, I'm like, because I jumped 800 feet quite a bit, you know, the first yeah, yeah. couple of years I was in before they moved it up to, what, 1250 or something like that? Yeah. So I was like, yeah, okay, 800 feet, no, no, no big deal. But I just, I still remember opening up and I said, head twist. I'm looking down going, man, <laughs> things awful close <laughs> down there. But 
it was technically a night jump because we went in just right before sunrise and we had an AC-130 on station and it was trying to stick around as much as it could. Now, back then they flew a lot lower than probably guys in Afghanistan and other places. Yeah. I'm probably used to seeing them because I think, I think that one was still an A model. Okay. AC-130 we had back then. So, so it's flying low. It, you could see it during the daytime at some point it, they finally said, Hey, we, we got to go. You yeah, know, we can't we can't hang around anymore. You know, we radioed it back, and uh, a guy I don't know if a lot of people know him, Ru- Ru- Rudy Perez. He was with the Ranger. He jumped in. He was at the closest DZ to where we went in, so they heard the call. So those guys basically just rucked up and ran. Almost the rest of the company. Uh, what did they do? About a ten k. I think it was. Wow. <laughs> and I don't know if you're ever up in Fort Lewis and you can talk to the guys at the Ranger Bat at Fort Lewis. I liked the area. It was a great place to be, but temperature wise, it was a, to me, it was probably the worst place to be stationed because yeah. you get climatized at 55 degrees. And it seemed like during the time I was there, everywhere we went, it was like 98, 100 degrees with 99% right. humidity. <laughs> but those guys basically ran and to link up with us on that drop zone. And by the time they got there, I mean, it wasn't anything that bad by, by any means, but yeah, yeah. got a little bit. We were all excited. Yeah, we did our combat store. And they're like, no, training mission. We're like, oh, okay. Oh, man. <laughs> yeah, it? It, went, it, went off, it went off that way. But I just remember Rudy showing up, and he's just drenched in sweat. And he's like, <laughs> I'm here to help. And I'm like, <laughs> okay. <laughs> but that was a I – I always told people, even the guys I took, you know, when I was with the 101st and we're in Iraq, I go, and all the places I, I went to, I still say that was probably the toughest deployment I ever did. Oh, really? Because we were there running patrols constantly. And also at that time, there was something wrong with MREs. Not that there's everything ever right with an MRE, <laughs> right. but, but that uh, they, they spoiled. They had a bunch of spoils, so they had no MRE, so they reverted back to these old LERP, Long Range Reconnaissance Patrol, dehydrated mills. Yeah. And you could only eat about half of those things because they just mm. bloat you up. Right, right. And, you know, before we deployed back, and regiment was, you know, in play by then, and... The regimental commander wanted to show how tough the range battalion was. So once we got done with that, at, I mean, we were constant, just soaking wet. You know, people feet were skin was peeling off their feet and yeah, yeah. all sorts of crazy stuff. And and uh, so we're sitting there, and they're like, "Everybody, take your boots off!" So we all took our boots off, and the battalion doctor was going down a line, and he had the assistants, and they're like writing people's names down. They came to me and Rudy, and they're like. Sergeant Ingram, you know, Aaron Air- Perez. And I'm, I was like, what's this for? Oh, you guys are going to be, since your feet are in decent enough shape, you're going to be the, one of the guys that's going to do this. It was like a 25 mile luck march Jeez. <laughs> back to the bait or to this area to be picked up and, and, t- and taken back to the base. And finally, the battalion commander is like, no, my, my guys are not doing that. So we, we didn't end up doing that. Oh, man. But when we got back, and I remember, think I still this day, remember going in and getting the first shower. You know, back then we were. I think we even did it when you, you were there in Panama. We joke about changing our t- you know t shirts, turn turn them inside out. Oh look, yeah, I got yeah. a clean t shirt. So I get <laughs> right. my first shower in about forty five days, and uh-huh. I distinctly remember looking in the mirror, and I didn't know who who I was. I dropped about 25, 30 pounds. Really? In, in, in that time frame. Yeah, I was down to weight when I was like a freshman in high school. Wow. Type type stuff. <laughs> you know, Man. when it came up. But I remember, and they actually kept us there for an extra week, week and a half. And they were feeding us steaks like every night, just trying to get color and stuff back back in our faces and stuff before we actually went home. But but yeah, and uh, I was actually talking to Rudy, uh, Rudy Perez. We're still good friends. We, we keep up. Uh, his son was playing football. In a college in Colorado that played one of the, the schools up in uh, Rapid City, South Dakota, where I was at, before you know came here to St. Louis, and uh, so we, we we linked up, and he told me, oh, he goes, cool. you know, he goes, it was that deployment. I really decided that I was probably going to get out. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> He's like, that's enough of this. Well, even the Rangers, they're like, man, hey Keith, 
you need to go to ranger school. If you can do this, ranger school is nothing. This, this is like five times harder, harder than, than, than ranger school. And I'm like, well, okay, I proved you I can do it. I don't need to go to ranger school. Yeah, <laughs> you know? right. But it was, you know, once again, you know, like I said, I go back to, I took what Sergeant Wells said to heart. And I just look at these things as building blocks. Sure. You know, going through, it's like, okay. And, you know, from then on, it, it's grown. I don't know how many guys are at, at battalions now, but. Well, I was going to say that. We talked about it before. You, you had two guys there, and you said, like, kind of like you were referring to, the the rangers would do, like, sticks lanes or platoon level exercises or whatever. You guys had to cover down on all, every one of those. I mean, it, what they yeah. they would rotate back out, but you had to stay and support each platoon or company or whatever when they were doing their whatever training mission they were doing or whatever it was. So that that's a that's commendable. I mean, because even when I was there, <clears throat> we had one guy per company, and now it's like I think they have two per company. So, but yeah, two guys supporting a whole battalion is crazy to me. Yeah, and you got you know, if you take in vacation time, people being sick and stuff. Yeah. You know, like I I think I told you there was times. Yeah. You know, now at first bat, I wasn't gone quite as much because we had the three guys, but. There at second bat, I mean, there was like one year I was gone 10 months out of the year. On average, probably eight months out of, out, out, out of the year I, I was yeah. deployed somewhere. You know, I always tell people, it's like, yeah, I was stationed at a lot of these places, but I didn't really spend a lot of time there. So if you ask me about right. the local area, I can't I can't really <laughs> tell you what, what to do. But but I ended up That's getting where my, you kept uh, your gear, you know, and then, yeah. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, pretty much it. I mean, there was times, a few times I remember coming home washing my clothes, packing them up and heading out the next day, man, you know, something else coming up yeah, and yeah. going down the road. I think we talked a little bit too, especially during Ronald Reagan era, you know, he loved to spin us up. So we were right. constantly going out doing train ups, rehearsals for stuff. And they get, you know, st stood down at the last minute. And yeah, actually yeah. on one of those, that guy I talked about in my basic train flight, he did become a, a CCT and we were setting up this one place and, and I, I was leaning against my rucksack. And other guys came in and sat down, and I could see this guy looking at me, and I'm looking at him, and he's like Keith, and I'm like Dave. He's like, yeah, hey, how, how's it going? So we actually went, oh, went, man, went up cool. on, on, on on a mission. That's cool. That, that happened down there. So yeah, small world. I mean, you just yeah. never know who, who, when and where you're going. You're going to link 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 up with guys that that come around. But especially that community too. Like you know, those CCT guys were all in in a mixed with soft stuff anyway so yeah it yeah. would be makes sense you guys are run into each other yeah you know i you know there because mccord had a big cct squadron there so i worked with some of the guys there and, and ended up knowing, knowing them cool. out there but but yeah we did the hunter i think that was my last real big thing with the rangers there was that one and then from there i actually got orders to fort bragg and i was like uh really don't want to go to Bragg. I, don't, I like being at the smaller units. That sure. was just me. Nothing against Bragg for the Bragg guys out there. But like I said, I just like staying at the smaller unit. And then uh, talking with uh, J-Mac, John McKay, and and one of their ALOs, they were up for something. I can't remember what it was. They were up at Fort Lewis for something. And they're like, hey, we got a billet. We need to fill. And I was actually trying to stay at Lewis because I was like, you know, my first four years, I had three three assignments. Yeah, so yeah. I was like, I went mine stains, and I just bought a house, a little small starter home, just to get credit going. When this whole thing with orders came up, and the Air Force was like, nope, 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 you got to go. So that's how I ended up at first bat. So ended up going to Hunter, spending uh, not quite three years there there at Hunter. Yeah, and uh, that was a good group. Uh, once again, gone quite a bit. Uh, I, I would say, I don't know if John talked about this or not in his, cause I didn't get a chance to watch the whole thing, but you know, one thing we did there was, uh, the Rangers decided it's like, you know, when we go in places, there may be some high value targets we need to take out prior, you know, whether it's a SAM site or something like that. Right. So they basically took the, uh, we came up with these teams. We had three, th three teams. And they were made up of uh, four deservers, one of us, and usually like at least one 11 Bravo infantry guy, maybe, maybe sometimes two, depending on what it was. So we had we had three teams, and John was on what we call the airborne team, where they go in, you know, static line or halo. I was on the water team, 
Okay. And then we had what we call the Hilo team, and uh, Tom Kotcher, who was there at the time, was was on that. And towards the end of that, actually, John became the team leader of the airborne team, and I ended up becoming the team leader for the water team. So I basically, believe I believe, yeah, you know, like for me, that's where I ended up going, getting scout swimmer certified. Yeah, going going through that training. So that that was there. That was probably one of the more physical stuff I ever did because you didn't do push-ups, you did flutter kicks <laughs> with stuff on it. And you're, you know, you ended up having to do what a was it a five climb over the horizon swim, uh-huh. and you had a hundred meter stretch of beach that you had to to get to in, in, oh, in okay. a time frame at night. So that. That was interesting. I'm not a big water person. I like a lot of guys you probably know hated jumping, but they did because it was part of the job. Right, right. And for me, that was the water side. I didn't mind uh-huh. the river stuff, and some of the small boat stuff, but yeah, you know, being out in the middle by yourself, swimming and feeling stuff bump up against you in the middle of the night as you're <laughs> set, setting or fit, fitting in and stuff was 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 definitely an, an, an interesting uh, concept. But so you know, once again, for the guys out there. You know, that was another uh, a building block I saw for our career field was, okay, you know, we went from just being at the talks to company level, going out controlling. And now, you know, at least two of us, not that Tom couldn't have done his, but they still had a guy there just to, on the, the airborne team. And the, we were the senior guys and they trusted yeah. us to run, to, to, run, to, run, to run the team. So that was interesting. And it was also kind of a building block to, uh, I think some of the stuff that regiment ended up doing because they saw what we were doing and it was hard for us to maintain that even on the battalion side because you're pulling F- fo's for yeah. observers out from their companies and platoons to do this mission so they were shy and plus we were you know at least one of us was forward with with that group but right great training uh, opportunities you know they, they end up doing doing some stuff that you know we haven't done before and you know, we had people like Randy Long and Clay Christian, uh, if you know them or not, yep, that even yep. at the night ID, you know, we even got them into where they were, where they were going out with the scout units. Oh, you know, nice. And pathfinder units and stuff and stuff like, you know, u- units like that. And did it as a test bed. But once again, it was kind of those things like, yeah, yeah, we want you guys, but we just didn't have enough people in the curve field that time. Right. Yeah. Because I remember at one point, especially there in the eighties and it kind of trolled in. I think by the time you came in, you know, we were like less than a thousand guys. Yeah. You know, yep. Across, across the world. So it was, it's hard to maintain some of the stuff that, that we you know, wanted to do or could do at, at, at that level. But, right. But yeah, first bat, nothing, nothing too, too glorious happened during during that time for me because I actually got orders to Panama once again. My name my name was in red before uh, <laughs> Just Cause and stuff kicked off. So uh, went from uh, first Ranger bat and one thing I can say for uh, about first Ranger bat, I think I heard Marty talk a little bit about it, or and you may experience it too. Is like when you first show up there, they look at you like, well, who are you? Can you hang? Can you not hang? Right, and I I remember showing up at first bat, and you know, kind of got the same cold, cold shoulder. Then I think I think J Mac was like, "Hey, you just came from second bat." Oh, well, okay, cool. You know, they're all like, "Yeah, all right." Now you're all now everybody's come on. good then. Yeah, you know, yeah, come, <laughs> come, come, come into the team, so that helped out. And actually, my company, I supported uh, fire support officer. I actually linked up with him again when I went to tenth special forces group. He was a battalion okay. commander. Oh, no kidding. Camp. And I actually linked up with, I think they were all from, yeah, they're all from first bat. There was probably another five guys on different teams that I worked with at, at first bat. Wow. When, when I was there, you know, either fire sport guys that went from Ranger to, to SF. So yeah, yeah. once again, you just never know who, who, who you're going to run into no coming doubt. in there. But from there, Panama, big thing there was just cause. And even before Operation Just Cause, you know, we were doing a lot of stuff down there. Yeah. That guy, you know, we had what was called freedom of movement. We call them exercises. Basically, we were poking a stick at a Noriega, stop us from doing this. So we would, you know, okay. have these convoys and we just tool around and try to make them stop us and stuff like that. We, we were doing that. And then we were there, all of us, 
for the coup attempt. Okay. And I think J Mac was talking about Bosnia, you know, about you know him going in and how they could have saved lives. So same thing happened in, in Panama during the coup attempt. The guys I was with, and I actually had a uh, the sniper team was 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 with us. We sat there and watched when Noriega kind of got back in control, and the sniper team's like, we got him in our sights, and they wouldn't let him. Could have ended it right there. Yeah, wouldn't let him take the shot, and we actually sat there and watched Noriega execute the leaders of the, the coup attempt. Wow. Sitting there because they were just right across this little inlet there from uh, Port Fort Fort Amador where where we were set up at. And, yeah. Yeah, that was that was hard hard to take. I'll that, bet. That, that, that was definitely hard to take that we got done with that. And, I mean, we were man. And that it wasn't the guys there in Panama that, you know, it's coming up high. I'm not going to get into politics, but that was hard and it kind of set our sights for the especially the guys that were stationed in Panama at the time that when just cause did happen, I think we had a little bit of a grudge. Oh, for yeah, sure. Going in because we're like, yeah, we uh, could have stopped that. And the other big thing about just cause, a lot of people don't know, is you know, armed forces network. Well, they didn't want to let anybody know that we were going in, so they were still doing normal PCS. Moves. We had guys that went through all the training because we were training up for this. I mean, yeah. we would do rehearsals actually where we were going to go in at all the oh, different really? units. Yeah. For this, you know, we did a lot like of training we, missions well, to we like did, Noriega and his guys. Yeah, I mean, we would train where we were going to go in at, but we would go into it other places too, so they didn't know exactly sure, sure. where we we're at. But we, had, you know, all of our the guys there were trained up, and then we're sitting there watching guys just. Oh nope, you got a PCS, but we're probably like a week out, and uh, <laughs> yeah, we had guys leaving like the night the night before. Oh my god, and. Uh, Steve Cox, I don't know if you remember Steve. Yeah. He shows up down there. And I remember meeting him at, at the plane. <laughs> He's getting off and uh, Dave Dave Lundquist and myself meet, meet him at the plane. We had all of his uh his gear for him sitting there. And as he got off the plane, we're like, here, 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 let's go over here. We'll get you to a room here shortly, but we gotta we gotta brief you up because he just came in just a couple of days prior. Wow. And uh and I remember looking at him going, are you, are you tax certified? He's like, no. Do you know how to control air? He's like, yes. Well, you're tax certified now. You're going with this company over here. Well, and he was for like, those well, who don't know, like for uh, if anybody listening, who's not quite tracking, yeah. like you and those guys, you were stationed in Panama, like during just cause, like it was, you, we had had people down there, you know, at Howard or at Fort Amador. Yes. Yeah. So yeah. So before the, you were there even on the ground before the Rangers even jumped in or the 82nd or whoever. So, oh, yeah, we basically started, there was a, how, how big were we? We were part of a, uh, another, I was with an, another tactical air support group, the 24th. And which for people that don't know those tactical air support squad, we were, you had the ground tech P guys that most of us know about. And then you had the air facts side of the house. So we had guys, uh, the pilots down there were the air, the, Air, Air, Air Facts flying uh, A-37s. They always made sure they were A-37s, not OA, because they still had the okay. minigun, the, the minigun in them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So there was, I think, 24, 25 of us, Tech P, that, that were stationed there at the time. We supported okay. the 193rd Infantry Brigade, which had two two battalions. The 87th was a, a non-airborne, and the, the first of the 508th was a, the airborne battalion. Then we had the two two battalion tack P's plus the brigade tack P there. But so yeah. Steve showed up. I was like, okay. <laughs> and yeah, I'll trust him. He's like, yeah, I, I control air. So I was like, okay, you're going to, you know, got, got him linked up, introduced him to the company he was going to be with. And like I said, it was maybe two days, three days later. We're going through, and we haven't before this. I mean, I know at least 24 hours prior, none of us has slept. Yeah, for, for 24 hours. I remember getting every, we're getting all spun up, getting everything done, and then they're like, "Okay, we got like, I don't know, three or four or five hours before you know we take off because we actually uh, the first of five away was going to air assault in okay to Fort Amador, which is right there for people who don't know it's. It was a combined base of Americans and Panamanians when Honoria's headquarters was there. And it, just right next to the 
the downtown area of, of, of Panama, the Commandancia yeah. headquarters area was at. And so we're, our, the guys we were with, we were going to air assault into there and secure Sport Amador. So we're all sitting around, you know, I remember just laying back on my rucksack going, okay, get some sleep. And uh, Tommy King, who was there at, working at Brigade at the time, comes running up to us and going, oh, here, your call signs have changed. The authentication system has changed <clears throat> and gave us all this stuff. And he goes, oh, by the way, we're, we're going to be heading out here shortly. And he's like, I got to go. And he just <laughs> takes oh off. My God. Going, okay, what, what? We got what now? We got to get rid of what? And doing all <laughs> about that time, we get the word load up. Because uh, what happened was Armed Forces Network announced the invasion before they were supposed to. Oh, my God. So we had to go in early. <sighs> <laughs> you know, so everybody was going in early. Unfortunately, because we were there for all the units that were there, staging out of Panama, we were hitting our targets before the airborne, the guys coming in, the 7th ID and the Rangers and the 82nd. Okay. You know, we're, we're scheduled to hit their target because, you know, they're flying in. The planes can only go so fast and speed up. They're not gonna... sure, sure. I think they sped up. Sped oh, up I got you. So you had to bump up the timeline. So they they were they were on the, uh, the old timeline. Yeah. So yeah, they were going to be later than. Oh, yeah, because, okay. you know, they're flying in, scheduled, you know, TOT time, drop time, yeah, yeah. whatever at, at, at this time. Oh, man, I didn't know that. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> we were actually going in before them. So we load up and I don't I have never seen a Blackhawk loaded with so many dudes. Oh really? <laughs> because we were sitting there, and we were actually the guys in the in the seat. I, I'm not kidding you. Their, their their bottoms were only hanging on by that much oh, of the seat, and so we had four guys across the seats, four or five, sitting on the edge. I was right behind one of them, and I had to hold on to him as the person behind me held on to me as we were taking off and going. Luckily, it wasn't a very long flight because you're just yeah, no flying doubt. around, going out in the ocean, coming in surprise. But because we had to leave early, we were supposed to have AH-64 Apaches take out some of the uh, the uh, air, air defense guns. Okay. They had their the, the ZPU, uh, I forget now, twos, 23 millimeters. They had sitting on the hilltops at Fort Amador. Okay. Well, since we took off early, the Apaches never, you know, they weren't there. So we're coming around. All of a sudden, you start seeing the tracer rounds, and I remember there was a young private because we had the army was the same same problem. They had guys coming straight out of jump school, right, and right. landing, getting on the bird. And I just remember this young private that was sitting next to me as we're flying in. He's like, "Oh my God, look at all those tracers!" And I go, "Yeah, there's three to four rounds in between those." <laughs> and he was like, "What?" So we're sitting there and we can see them, you know, initially they just heard us and they're just, you know, as, as you see in a lot of stuff, they're just shooting the sky, hope, yeah, hoping, yeah. hoping for the, the golden BB to come in. And for guys that have worn radios, I had my radio on, the pilot and co-pilot, my, my frequency, our strike freak we had was close to theirs. So their stuff was bleeding over into my headset. Oh, so I'm hearing them, you know, just like, holy, shit, get down, get down, get lower, get lower, get lower. <laughs> and about that time, it was like, you felt it. It wasn't, it wasn't enough to bring the chopper down, but you felt it go, the, the tell of the chopper just Oh, like you're taking rounds? Yeah, we took one, I think one, one, one round in, in, in the tell. And so I'm hearing the pilots, you know, pilot and co-pilot freaking out. They get oh, down so low that we had this water coming straight into the helicopter because, you know, the prop wash was just blowing the seawater. So, you know, half of us, if you're in the front two rows, we were half wet, soaking wet by the time, the time we, got, we, we got to the LZ. So we're down there, we're doing this. And of course, by that time, all the helicopters are, you know, worried about tracing. We finally got below because the AAA were on the hilltop, so they can only traverse so so far down. So we got down below that, and that's why we were fl flying as, as, as low as we were. Oh, nice. Popped in, we sit down. Luckily, training, you know, doing that there a couple of times, you know, when we got out, you know, run out, you hit the ground. And of course, this young private I was with, he lands next to me. But for some reason, we all go out like this, you know, fanning out like you do normally. Yeah. For whatever reason, he ended up like this to me. 
his barrel of his M16 was here and he had it, he didn't have it on safe and it's like, pow. What? <laughs> right by my face. Oh I'm my like, God. Whoa. And I'm like, dude, man, private, get that over here. And I go, here, put that on safe. You know, and then his sergeant's like, who shot that? Oh my God. Get over here with, yeah, <laughs> keep you guys safe. So we hit and we start taking machine gun rounds as soon as we landed from a position. So I'm sitting there, it was me, the company commander and his RTO, the fire support officer, his chopper ended up landing somewhere, not where it was supposed to. He wasn't there. So I was it. I was, I was the whole fire support for, for, for the company. I was talking to the FOs and all this. And I was probably, I still laugh about this one because we're taking fire and he's like, let's go. So we got up, there was a stump. I don't know. Maybe it was probably about that big around where a tree was cut down. And he runs behind that. His RTO's laying there beside him. I'm scrunched up next to him. We're all trying to lay <laughs> for cover behind the stump as machine gun fires grazing over our heads. And he finally looked at me and he goes, this is probably not a very good place to be, is it? I was like, no, sir, it probably isn't. He's like, okay. And once machine gun fire stopped for a little bit, I don't know if they were changing ammo or what or what they were doing, but you know, it's like, I was like, let's go. And so we stood up and there was a small building close by that we ran up and got, got behind the wall of that one. Yeah. And I just remember when we ran up to it, there were some doors and those guys just ran up to us. So I cautiously went up to the door and, and this is where I almost had a, a, probably a friendly fire because I was sitting there and all of a sudden I hear bash against the, the window of the, the glass door. And I'm yeah. like, whoa. And I just happened to see a US there was like five Navy guys that didn't make it out in time. Oh, really? So they were locked in there. <laughs> yeah, they they locked themselves in, in, in the small uh, building. I'm not even sure what, 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 what it was. I was like, what? And they're like, yell, hey, get us out. And I was like, no, stay there. Just, you know, wait it out. Just stay on the ground. <laughs> so we're sitting there. I got up, talked to AC. We got some eyes on the area. The AC, we had support in us. And he was scouting around. Took out the uh, machine gun nest that they had set nice. up like i think it was three guys in that one end up taking that out but then then basically we're behind the wall here machine gun nest was over here i was kind of controlling and we we're going to head on out but we didn't notice that there was some other guy sitting here and i still remember to this day because we're doing one at a time and it was my turn to go and i just got done talking to the ac and i put my authenticator this is back in the day we still had paper authenticators okay. and i remember putting it in my side pocket and for whatever reason i took out to go uh, around or from the wall and i decided oh i better make sure i got this stuff secured so i pulled back and as i was pulling back around just went right in front of my face i mean i felt Whoa. i felt the heat from the round jeez across my nose but i just remember i was like man if i didn't just pull back for that second to check, you know, tap, tap my pocket to make sure I, I, I had, I had it secured in there. Who, who knows what was happening. So we get oh, through geez. that, yeah. uh, uh, some of the other guys on the ground took, 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 took care of those guys. Cause we had to clear these big, huge buildings. I don't know if you remember going to Amador, the, you know, these multi-story buildings they had there yeah, at the yeah. time. Well, one of the jobs for us was to clear these buildings, which got us to, to the ocean side of, of Fort, Fort Amador. And uh, I was like, well, you know, I mean, if I can get up in these top windows, I can see better, you know, to, to control from. And uh, yeah, yeah. so I go inside the building, we start clearing and they have false ceilings, false walls. You know, the hallways are like the door. You got hallways that face a row of windows that face outside. Then you got a hallway. Then you got the buildings and the offices with their doors. And then you got the false ceiling above them all. You know, the guys would be going through clearing and I'd be following along with them. And guys would start popping, you know, they get into the ceilings, the PDF payment, oh, really? force, drop down, start shooting at you again. And it, they have to go back and clear, you know, since they're, you know, we were going there, we were trying not to kill as many as we could, you know. Sure. So we went in there initially with concussion type grenades, throw them in a the room, mm -hmm. bang, knock them out. <laughs> Well, the sergeant that uh, I was with the team following behind was clearing 
and some of these offices had welding uh, windows in the hallway. Well, he got up, they busted the window, but he decided to stand behind the door against the door. They threw the concussion grenade in. It landed next to the door on the opposite side, blew the door off the hinges, knocked him out. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> <laughs> so I ended up having to take over the team because I was the only NCO at the time. So I ended up, ended up clearing, finished clearing that floor out. And it got to the point that we realized that we couldn't get these buildings cleared with the guys we had. Cause like I said, yeah. guys, they just get in the ceiling and go, you know, go in there. And we had one guy go into one of the bathrooms and the guys, you know, open the door, they would shoot. The 60 would come in and they would, uh, the guy would shoot back at us, threw in a concussion grenade. The guy was still shooting back at us, threw in a frag grenade and we didn't hear anything, but he was still alive. The guy was actually standing in the toilet in a stall, you know, with the metal yeah, yeah. doors around, bullet holes, everything was never was never hit. Really? Yeah. So I always tell Amazing. people it's like you think maybe you're you know places, but you just never know where you know munitions are going to fly. Sure. You know what damage you're actually going to do. You know yeah, whether yeah. it's bomb and stuff like that. You may think you took it out, but it, good chance that it didn't get taken out because everything is based on where stuff hits, ricochets, blows up. You know, right ground the whole thing but yeah so wow keep going i mean gotta cut this short so they decided okay so they pulled us out the battalion commander colonel fitzgerald got i don't know where he got this 105 from but he brought in a toad 105 set it up to the building they had a megaphone so they're like give up give up nothing direct fire direct lay bam <laughs> blow, blow a hole oh, really? jeez you know, and as they're doing it, it'd be like, uh, 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 and it's like, boom, blow, blow a hole in it. So we got them to clear out the first building. We had the second building. So we moved back in. And guys in Korea would know what I'm talking about, the Benjo ditches and drainage ditches. Yeah. Well, they had kind of those there in Amador that would flow out, out, out to the sea. So it was, I don't know, about chest high. So we're in that following along. There's a... Uh, I think they called it, it was a V300. It's a light skin, uh, uh, four wheel dual axle uh, armored vehicle with like a okay. 90 millimeter cordless gun in it. Okay. It was sitting there, it was active. And uh, Dave Lundquist, he was with the battalion. And just the way I was sitting, and it, they didn't bring the 90 against it, but they were shooting machine gun towards it. I couldn't get a, a good look at the target so i was like you know davy can you see what i'm talking about and where he was set up he's like yeah so we got the ac on it and and dave's calling in call, calling in the, the ac on it and i'm listening in and the company commander he's like oh i want to see this so he's standing up and this is only this vehicle is only like four, four, 40 meters away Jeez. and uh I was like, yeah, you better get down because they're going to, I think they shot 40s, 40, 40 mesh metal at it. And, yeah, yeah. Uh, and we got the warning because the ACs were so busy and we only had so many that yeah. they would land at Howard, fuel, re rearm and take off. So after the first time, they didn't know what their tweak was. Oh, okay. So they would come back and say, we're not really sure if we're bore sighted <laughs> you know, between taking off and landing and all that. That could be uh, hairy if you're only that truck. Yeah, only 40 that's meters why I had away. Dave, you know, I was like, Dave, if you can do this, because I'm, I plan on ha ha having my head down <laughs> inside the ditch, but the company commander, <laughs> right. he's like standing like this. And I'm like, I reached up and grabbed him. It was like, yeah, you better get down. And he was like, Oh, I want to take a look about that time. You know, I got, you know, round, rounds on the way. And you know, all of a sudden it was like, boom, 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 you know, lights up like a, you know, a Christmas tree out there sparkling, you know, sparks from the mesh metal. And, and then the vehicle blows up. And he was like, yeah, appreciate it. Sorry, <laughs> on that side, but yeah. took that out and ended up clearing, clearing the next building after the first day. Yeah. You know, for the most part, you know, most of the major fighting was done at that yeah. time. But, and I remember, uh, David linked up with me cause we were getting ready to switch out. I was going to go back, back to battalion talks. I had, some stuff I had to take care of with with, with the ALO. And I remember, I think, I don't know if the battalion commander or the company commander, 
But he's like, hey, what are you guys doing right now? We're like, well, nothing really right now. He's like, can you go check and clear out these huge drainage culverts that ran from inland out to the sea? <laughs> so there's me and Dave. We're like walking in these culverts and got our little angle flashlights at the time. You know, yeah. sitting there going in there to see if any PDF had run in and and and, and try to hide, hide hide inside these culverts. And I wasn't we weren't really too worried about that. We were more worried about some snake or something coming out and probably right. end up biting and stuff. So we ended up doing that, cleared out of that. We ended up going uh from there we went to uh the Commandancia. That's where I got my little okay. picture of all we all finally linked up because uh oh, nice. Steve Cox, you know, he showed up and he spent half his time he was actually rescuing family members. Oh, time. okay. And, uh, you know, he's running under fire, carrying kids underneath his arms and trying to get him to cover. And Johnny uh, Rodriguez, uh, he came in. He was in with himself on the uh, – because he brought the, the mark system in. Mm -hmm. So, he, you know, we all kind of flew in separate, you know, kind of like nature of the job coming in separate. So, sure. once we got to the Commandants, we actually all, all finally linked up and uh, ended up helping clear that area out and, and get it out. And, my ALO at the time, whatever reason, he decided he was going to go souvenir hunting. So we're in the Commandancia, and for people that don't know, the Commandancia was the headquarters for the payment defense force in Noriega, but it's in the old French Quarter. So it's it's European built. So your alleyways and roadways are really narrow with high high rise buildings. So, and because we had to leave so early, normally I never went anywhere with my stripes on. Uh, sewn on my uniform yeah yeah. but for that one we did and you know it's like one time we're sitting there talking i'm talking to the fo's and closing a secure area and all of a sudden it's like ping ping and we're starting to get sniped at now the panama snipers weren't really snipers they were just guys in right. the high rise just people shooting at you yeah <laughs> so they weren't really that good at it <laughs> when it came up but i did notice and everybody, even the, the FOs are like, hey, Ingram, what? Looks like he, they're shooting at you. <laughs> because all the rounds were skipping off next to me. And I'm like, man, I bet you see my stripes. And about that time, Probably I did, up, yeah. End, end up cutting cut the things off after that time. But <laughs> the ALO, he decided to go, that's crazy. go souvenir hunting. And because uh, that's what we had by that time was, you know, a few people running around. Because yeah. Panama had uh, the Dignity Battalion which was the, we called it the Dingbat Battalion, but basically right. it was Noriega letting all the criminals out of prison and made them into a, quote, military unit. Oh, uh, okay. At, at that time. So you had a lot of them running around just being criminals, really, more, more than anything else. But yeah. But the tank commander asked for our ALO, and I'm like, I don't know where he's at. And he's like, well, sorry, you need to go find him. So here I am walking around by myself, downtown French Quarter, searching searching for him i finally see him digging around in some rubble and i just grabbed him. He's like sir come on let's go back <laughs> not quite secure yet but yeah but yeah we uh ended up staying there got cleared out there uh about that time get a call on the radio that uh actually i think it was mike mike denny was on the radio and said i needed to come back to the brigade area so they brought a chopper in i flew out got back the uh the seventh special forces group guys that were up at Rio Hato couldn't talk to the AC one thirty. So I ended up going up there and working with them oh, cool. uh, for about three days, maybe a week working with them to, for them to complete their, their mission. Yeah. And the only reason I, I bring that up because that segue into one, one of the other assignments. So I ended up working with them. They were like, Hey, appreciate it. Can, can you stay with us? And we're like, no, nah, I got to get back. Came back, a lot of people don't know, you know, everybody left, but the war actually went on, well, the conflict operation went on for like another two months because after that, we were actually out in the jungle looking for everybody that ran away. Oh, okay. So we spent that time just, uh, <laughs> actually the one area where we set up our, our operations area was a retired, I think, 7th Group Command Sergeant Major that retired in Panama, he actually set up his place. I mean, he had Constantina wire, everything. He dug foxholes. So he was like, hey, if you want to use my place, stage out of, 
you can. I, I got connections, so we we're using him. <laughs> kind of was like, yeah, nice. these guys. So we go hunt, you know, these guys down. We pick up, you know, come in. I never had much much problem once we found them. But right. while we were there, I get another call on the radio saying, "You got to come back to Howard Air Force Base now." And I'm like, you know, Dave and <laughs> I think Johnny. I don't think Steve was on that one. Steve was out doing some other stuff. They're looking at me like, "Hey, what's going on?" I'm like, I don't know. I'm thinking like my parents died or something. So yeah, yeah. I get back to Howard. Mike Denny <laughs> links up with me and goes, "Hey, you like football?" And I was like, "Yeah." He goes, "Okay, get cleaned up. You're going to the Super Bowl." What? <laughs> <laughs> I was like, "What?" He goes, "Like, yeah, you, you got picked to be the, Air, the the Air Force rep for the uh, Just Cause for for the Super Bowl." So, I actually got wow. a free free week long ten day vacation up to New Orleans at the time. Nice. And was because uh, they picked one guy from uh, each service, Army. So we had a uh, guy from the eighty second, uh, a Navy SEAL, uh, a Marine Corps, Lance Corporal myself and then we had a guy from the coast guard oh, okay i'll show up there and the owner of the new orleans saints actually paid for us to come up oh and, nice yeah it was nice it was it was, it was kind of cool yeah, I just yeah. Kinda cool. they brought us all down there it, it wasn't aired on tv but during the super bowl but at the pregame ceremony they brought us all out in the field and they read you know read our bio what we did you know during no the kidding. Op operation just cause and which was cool but the coolest part was after the game down on Bourbon Street, everybody started recognizing us. So we didn't have to buy a drink all, all nice. the rest of the time we were there. Nice. But yeah, so that that, that was kind of cool. I got the uh, I got a chance to go to the Super Bowl. one and only time going go to the Super Bowl and got to stand yeah, that's awesome. the, the owner's box and met the NFL commissioner and wow. All these people. We actually got to go to the uh, the NFL owner, team owners pre Super Bowl party. So oh, it was really? my first time being around millionaires slash billionaires. So that was like, <laughs> yeah, that, that was definitely in a, 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 an interesting time. But, <laughs> but yeah, we did that, and uh, everything's kind of kind of calmed down. Uh, we started doing more stuff, and this is actually where you come in because we basically left Panama. Was it ninety one? I think it was. Yeah, yeah, yeah ninety one. Yeah. July. Yeah, what was the deal with that? Because I know you guys explained it to me, I think, when I first got there. You said something about there's a treaty and you had to draw down troops yeah. or something. Or... Uh, basically, what happened was after Just Cause was done, they decided to start really implementing the uh, Panama Canal Treaty, which was done back in like 79, 78 under yeah. Carter. And so we had to start a drawdown. The uh, wing commander at Howard. When he got told, it's like, hey, you got to draw this, you know, so many positions down. So what he did, he took every tenant unit that wasn't part of that wing and said, oh, you guys are leaving. So it was like uh, us, okay. the combat control guys that were down there, some of these other units that were tenant units. And it was July 5th. We come back to work after the holiday. Yeah. And every one of us got orders. I think it was like the first time that a unit in the Air Force actually did a PCS together. Yeah. It was like World War II or something they, they, they were telling us. But they basically said, on the 5th of July, you guys are leaving. You're going to davis Monthan, and you have until the 31st of July to be out of here. So we basically stopped the operations all together and just, you know, we had vehicles, family members, yeah. you know, everything you had to get out. That's how, you know, from there, that's, we ended up at uh, DEM. I don't know if you remember, too, that me and Tony Castellano, we basically showed up for about two weeks, three weeks, and we were back down doing a rotation. I can't remember if you guys went on that one or not, that first one. I don't remember when I first started going yeah. down there, you know, but yeah. Because I, I think you were you were there when we got there, right? Yeah, I got there, um, I want to say, let's see, September, maybe? Yeah. So it was so, like later so, in the year. Yeah. Maybe October. I don't know. I can't. Yeah. I can't yeah. You're right. You're right. It was because because I think you got there right when I was leaving. It's like, yep, yep. I'm going to be your supervisor. <laughs> All right. Got to go. <laughs> See you later. <laughs> <laughs> you know, left because it was like October, I think, is when Tony and I went back down and did a six month road. I think you guys showed up down there, actually. Yeah. We started, we started some of your training down there. Yeah. I think Eric Harris picked me up from the airport. And then there was like no hardly anybody in the building. Like I think everybody yeah. else was kind of doing other things. So yeah, but Jimmy they, was there. And, yeah, yeah. So basically, they, you know, they PCS is what we still had the mission down there, right? 
you know, supporting the guys down there. So I remember me and Tony were picked to go straight back down, <laughs> back down there for, I think we did either a four or six month rotation down there. But yeah, that's, that, that's why we had to pick up a move because it was all dealing with the Panama Canal Treaty. And, yeah. and that's why in 94, you know, the, the, the 193rd Brigade was officially pulled out. And that's okay. where we got disbanded and everybody went off to, to, to their different places. But yeah. Yeah. DM that was a pretty good deal. I, that was a pretty good deal to go TDY down there. And, oh yeah. You know, that was not bad. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that was definitely a, a moneymaker time. And yeah, I don't know yeah. if you remember, but, Colonel Rousseau was so upset about pulling us out down there that he's like, oh, they're going to pay. And that's why we ended up staying like hotels and oh, doing yeah. all that type of stuff. Cause he's like, oh, oh, they're going to pay. But it didn't mean a lot of time gone. I was actually going yeah. through because actually you get a hold of me. I kind of boxed up most of all of my stuff and I was yeah. going through some stuff and I saw the orders for that or for one of those that we went on, but it was like Panama or Benning, Panama, JRTC, Panama, back home. Right, right. You know, so we spent a lot of, lot, lot of time uh, TDY there doing stuff. And, and the uh, only people that were down there was like uh, Denny and then Lunk. And then you, there's a radio maintenance guy. Yeah, there was a right? radio was maintenance. We left, them. we left one radio maintenance guy. I can't remember his name either. Then Mike Denny, Lunk, and then Colonel Russo. Okay. Was there. That was one thing, being the NYC up there at Davis Monthan. I could pretty much sign off on most paperwork, but there was some stuff that was like, oh, you need an officer's signature. And, I, and actually, it's, once again, a small world, the uh, 12th Air Force DO. And one of the pilots for the A-10 units there at DM, he was a Ranger ALO at second bat when I was there. Oh, no kidding. So I actually, between those two, and I knew the, the, the DO, he was a, a, a FAC at Shaw wow. when, when, when I was there. So he knew me, and we, we went on some <laughs> TDYs together. So between those two guys, I could just walk up to him going, hey, can you sign this? And they're like, oh, yeah. Sure. yeah. And they, they would sign whatever paperwork that, that, that needed to be signed there. Because I don't yeah, remember, yeah. you know, we didn't have any officer billets there. No, yeah. So, that's, so that was, that was about a weird that. And that, situation. I actually, not, nothing against the officer and career field, but that, that was kind of nice because kind of left yeah. for us to decide what, what needed to be done and stuff oh, like yeah, that. Oh, yeah, that was such a, I, I, like I said before, that, that was where everything began for me. Like, that was the greatest, yeah. you know, all the training you guys, you guys put us through and, just the the um, the environment was great. I mean, it was yeah, that was a really yeah. good. I, I got lucky uh, yeah. to have that first assignment for sure. Yeah. I just, just real quick side note, going back to Just Cause, uh, talking about radio maintenance. We actually had a young airman that showed up there, a, a, a radio maintenance air, airman, A one C, right before Just Cause, and and our radio, one of our radios in our uh, system went bad, so I had him chopper chopper him out to us at Amador. Well, when he got on the ground, about that time, the, the Panama Defense Force was trying to take back some of the, you know, they were, they were going to try to take Amador back. So they collected yeah. themselves and did an attack. And I remember looking at him going, you know how to use that thing? And I pointed at his, his M16. He's like, yeah, I think so. And I was like, let's go. And I put him on, you know, on the front line with myself and <laughs> the other guy. And he actually told me years later that I ruined his Air Force career because he went off regular air force jobs and he said i go i hated it and i couldn't yeah, get I'll back. Bet. you know he goes i i couldn't get back but he was he was all gung-ho about it he was like yep let's go nice. let's do it but yeah segue but uh <laughs> but yeah it's funny i said dm was it, it was a good assignment i mean it was a good i think for you guys it wasn't bad for the fact that like i said for me i mean honestly when i got to shaw i was there six months because I was only there about nine months, 10 months before I PCS. And one of the NCOs looked at me and goes, did you ever have your check ride? Because it was like, I showed up there and it was like, Here, here's your stuff. Go to the field. Yeah. And nobody ever said anything to me. So, I, you know, like I said, I kept volunteering and going. And I was like, no, uh -huh. no, I never had my, <laughs> my mission readiness check ride. And they're like, oh, well, we, I guess I guess we better do one <laughs> on you. So, but so at least. You didn't have to go through that because I tell you what, it yeah. was it was definitely learn as you went when I showed up my first duty. Oh, so uh, yeah. They used to have this booklet. Uh, they stopped printing it sometime I was in, but it basically had everything we did. And we put in one of those flight crew checklist things. It was about yeah, yeah. that thick. 
And honestly, I'd be out there. Hmm, 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 okay, yeah, yeah, this is what. And my ALO, he just graduated uh, AGOS. Okay. At operation school. And I remember that first, it was a minor exercise down at Fort Stewart, but he's like, so, and I'm like, uh, this is my first time. And he's like, oh, well, it's my first time too. <laughs> I guess we'll just play it by ear. Uh, but yeah, so at least that aspect, hopefully you didn't have to be crashed. No, no, it was good. Yeah, you guys squared us away for sure. Yeah, it was awesome. And we had some good good NCOs there. Oh, started. for sure. I mean, Eric, I keep in, you know, Harris, I, I keep in touch with off and on. Uh, Tony, I don't know what happened to Tony. I haven't really yeah. kept up with him, but. Keep, and I've seen some of the other airmen off and on. Yeah, Steve was still there. Steve Cox was still there. Um, yeah, we had some good dudes. Yeah, there. down there. But like I said, in yeah, 90- Sundance and I, I think came in together because Sun Sundance and I, Sundance Gardino, for those who don't know, yeah. is what I'm talking about. He and he and I think he, he and I went to basic, like tech school, jump school, survival, all together. So you had to deal with both of us at, at once. Yeah, so that, I, I, I do. I, I do. Yeah, well, you guys were easy. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was lucky. <laughs> you, you guys come in uh, and get on the team and stuff as it comes yeah. up. And yeah, I know we were. I, I that was probably the one thing about the ETAC program when they started up with. I did not agree with that. They said you had to be what was it, a senior airman. Yeah, or a select sergeant, and like I said, when I came in, it was, hey, as you came in, you got your mission readiness status, you were expected to know the job, right? And whether it's controlling air, radios, antennas, whatever, you, you're. Yeah. And I think if the opposite way around, I don't know if I would have liked it as much, because sure. as young airmen, I was like, oh, okay, I, you know, people trust me, and plus, I, I didn't come in until I was twenty, yeah. so it wasn't like so you're a little older so, guy anyway. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I did, I did like that. So I kind of, I, hopefully I did that with the guys I was with. I tried to like, no, I do expect you because you being there and, and done it, you know, you, you don't know what's going to happen. Sure. And you can't have that single point of failure. So, right. You know, my, my philosophy was anybody should be able to pick up that mic and call in an airstrike. No, I, you guys put yeah. us on the mic a lot. I mean, I remember like my first control in Panama was an A7 out there in that range that we used to go to. Oh yeah. <laughs> um, you know, we used to go to Gila Bend all the time. Yeah, you guys, you guys gave us a lot of good training on yeah. on control and so. But yeah. you know, that, but that, that was my because that's the way I kind of got brought up. You know, in the career, but was you know. For sure. Do, do the mission. So that was the one thing. And I think now they changed it, don't they? Are they now? I want to say it's like right. Yeah, they 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 train them up so they be they're like JTACs. Or a lot earlier than we were, yeah. I think so. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. so that to me, I heard. I think I, I read that or heard that. I'm glad they kind of they kind of gone for sure. back to that. But yeah, yeah, yeah. Dean was a good time. That was. Uh, I don't know if you guys ever got a chance to go. Did you guys ever go on the like Peru or Argentina or? Nope. Yeah, nope, I know. I, that was one thing I kind of fought a little bit with the guys. It's like, yeah, we need to get younger because I know, you know, you had to have a Spanish speaker and. Yeah, that, that whole aspect. But Tony that, probably went on those a lot, I'm sure. Yeah, Tony and Eric definitely. One of them was. Oh yeah, Eric for sure. Yeah, <laughs> one, one of them each time. But so that that freaked me, that, me out when I when I when Eric because I mean he's he's as white as they come and and he started speaking Spanish like fluent Spanish. I was like, well, that's it was so weird to hear him like you know. Yeah. Ah, blonde down there. Yeah. yeah. Well, he grew up. He spent his childhood in Spain. Oh, right. Yeah. That, yeah. I, I I didn't know that. I was I because yeah. I mean I was new. I didn't know who he was. You know. Yeah. So it was fun. It was cool. But so that 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 was interesting going down and you know training with the different you know some of us that went down there training with the different uh, South American countries. Yeah, when it was down there. That was the only bad part was, <laughs> you know, we we go into one country and it's like okay yeah here this is how you do stuff and then you go to the country right next to them and they're like kind of at each other and you're like oh okay yeah. this is how you do your stuff. And, <laughs> So that was one thing I remember a few times we went there. It's like, don't talk about the last deployment. Don't tell them that you were here. Don't tell yeah. them that you, know, you, you were over here coming in there. But that was all the whole Cold War, the Cold, yeah, Cold yeah. War thing going on, you know, keeping Russia and the communist side out of our sphere of influence during that sure. time. But from there, uh, actually, I think, yeah, because I actually had orders back to Second Ranger Bat from Davis Monthan. Then I get the call saying, hey, we're starting off this soft tact P where we're putting guys at the uh, SF groups, you know, and they're like, we would like for you to go 
and, and, and be at one of them. I was like, eh. And I remember Fort Carson was open. Oh, and I was yeah. like, oh, yeah, I always kind of wanted to go to Carson, but they never had jump position. And I said, yeah, I'll, oh, I'll do Carson. So that's how I ended up at Fort Carson. And I think I got in there. I think we, last of us left, but like December of 94. So I showed up right after Christmas, so basically 95. Got it within yeah. in, in, in January of, of, of 95. And it was kind of like almost being back at the Ranger Bat again when I first showed up there. I was like, oh, who are you guys? But <laughs> that where it kind of swayed where I was in Panama, you know, seventh group having problems talking to like AC 130s and stuff. And I don't know if you remember during the Gulf War, there was an SF unit that got compromised. Yeah. That was on a think so, reconnaissance yeah. mission, and they didn't know how to get a hold of close air support. And they were in a running gun battle. And luckily, they think somebody finally got on a guard freak, and a pilot happened to hear them calling for help and went to oh, okay. and coordinate and got it. So I know that's part of it. There's maybe more into it, but I know from my side, you know, that was a big thing where they were like, well, maybe we need to, you know, get some guys at the groups to, uh, start integrating these guys a, a little bit more in, in, into the uh, close air support system. So that's how we ended up there. Uh, I think there was what, four of us? Yeah, there was four of us initially at each of the SF groups plus the Hilo group. And luckily for me, like I said, I showed up the one and I ended up pretty much supporting that one battalion and <laughs> these couple of uh, companies and, and teams because I'm like, oh, hey, I know that guy. Hey, I know that guy. Hey, I know that guy. <laughs> and they're like, hey, Keith. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We want, you know, we want, we want Keith, Keith, Keith on our team. So. Oh, man, that but that made it so easy to fit in. Yeah, it did. Yeah. It, did. It, it, it did for the most part. And like I said, one of the town commanders was the FSO I worked with. So, so nice. he knew me coming into there. So we kind of integrated fairly easy with these guys, I, I would say, for the most part yeah. of that. And be honest with you too i was like hey you know 10th group yeah you know at that time it's like oh yeah they got europe you know that part of the world and i'm like hey i can go to europe become a tourist you know see see some cool <laughs> right. stuff and i think i did a couple of us went up to norway for a big uh, soft exercise and i was like oh yeah this is gonna be fun you know doing this type of stuff and then yeah uh bam you know bosnia happens uh-huh uh and then we gotta get involved with that uh, initially, we started deploying with the teams to do uh, combat search and rescue out of uh, Italy in, into okay. Bosnia. You know, NATO flights, U.S. flights going in and out of there. So we had a team. We had guys rotating in, in and out on that. And once again, though, it was like there was one of us. So you had like three SF teams that rotated alert status. And then we had a, uh, the Air Force team with the, the pararescue and CCT guys. And then I think the French had a team there. So we would all rotate through. But for me, I only got basically two weeks. Well, actually one week where I could stand down during those rotations because, you know, you had to do a train up. But when the SF team's on, I just bounce from one team to the next to the next. So I do three weeks on, on alert basically get one week downtime and then you start the train up side of the house again for, for a week prior before you, you, you go on alert. So I, it, it was fun. I mean, done some stuff there in, in that arena to a certain degree, but never quote really embedded with a uh, combat search and rescue team, the, the whole, the whole aspect of it. So that, 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 that was interesting to learn. Uh, you know, one of the team guys, big Al, he was a, uh, prior on the darker, darker side, came over to SF and he was actually part of the guys that went in to Panama to get guys out of the prison. And we called in some AC-130 overhead because one of their helicopters got shot down hmm. during the exfil. So we were the guys, our TACP were the guys that coordinated and got the AC over to them to, uh, to get those guys extracted and we were just sitting there talking and then he's like what what and it's like oh yeah that was me i was one of those guys i was like oh yeah oh my god my team was on the other end of the radio getting you guys out and he's like oh cool so we came good buddies that's so crazy 
and he was he taught me a lot of different things on shooting and stuff and you know what, what, what the guys do so i got a lot of additional stuff on the shooting side we only got called out once uh, we went feet wet once over into bosnia uh, we had a french aircraft that went down okay. and we would get hits but prior to us showing up with know, the team that we re- relieved there they went in they actually got shot at a couple of times so SOP was, you know, if you lose the beacon, then, you know, we would end up turning around. So we, so for me, got feet wet a couple of times over in the country. We lose, lose track of the signal because, and we finally came out that they probably, I don't, I never heard what happened to them. I'm assuming they yeah. probably didn't survive. And we figured the Serbs had their emergency radio and were trying to set up oh, okay. hand, hand force on that side. But, oh, okay. So we did, I did that there, uh, 10th group. Uh, unfortunately, I don't know, unfortunately, fortunately, however you want to look at it, our colonel, because, you know, just being there at Carson and what we were doing, I mean, honestly, the other squadron guys couldn't compete for like NCO of a quarter and right. all this. Stuff. I mean, nothing against the guys, good guys. No, it's just the nature of everywhere. your job that you were doing. Yeah. But so I actually got pulled from the SF team about, Let's see, I got there in 95, left in 2000. So I, I finished up. Oh, well, let me go back. So then we went into Bosnia. That was, <laughs> I was on the last CSAR rotation when we got the call we're going into Bosnia. And John Knight, Steve Colbert, and Nate Holton were back in the rear. And they called me. And I mean, we were like getting on the bird. And luckily, we didn't have to go straight over and do another 90 day rotation or 120 day rotation because we just finished up four months so basically i got back home was just back for a little bit and ended up going back to bosnia and then we were in and out of bosnia up until 90 late 98 because i was on the last deployment there and we were training up nato teams to take over but it, it wasn't too bad i mean it was a lot of peacekeeping uh, uh civil civil affairs as sf calls it ca mission going on right, there right. Uh, you, we, we, we still had you had little groups that were still mad at each other. But the one thing I learned there, I learned about people in societies. Because, you know, you had the Serbs, the the Bosniaks, which were the Muslim Serb, Serb people there. Mm-hmm. And you had the Croats. Right. And each group hated each other. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, literally, I mean, we're talking generational, 800 years. You know, right. going back to back back to the crusade. So it definitely definitely made you learn uh, how to uh, deal with people and different mm-hmm. uh, style of people when it when it came up. And had a couple of calls. Uh, primarily, uh, last time there, uh, can't remember Kirby's last name. He was a CCT guy that was there. But me and him linked up. And uh, one thing we were going to do was uh, go back and check all the uh, HLZs that were pre plotted. And the army's like, I go, hey, I need a vehicle. And we had these Nissan Pajero four-wheel drive European style Nissan cars. Right, right. And uh, but they gave us this old broken down one. But luckily, <laughs> once again, we were driving around one day when we first got it and we were starting having engine problems. And I see this army maintenance little I don't know if you're even bothered, it's just we had little compounds just everywhere. Yeah. And it was just like this one was just maintenance. And I was like, well, let's pull in here and Got in there and it was a contract place. The, the guy that ran it was contract, but he was retired Air Force. Okay. So he was like, oh, I'll fix it up. He goes, give me two days. So we hung out in the hotel and he rebuilt the engine, did everything. We drove it back and the army's like, does your AC work? Oh, yeah. <laughs> but, so we ended up taking that. We're tooling around. And one thing we did was, was in Bosnia, minefields everywhere. And you could tell the guys that just showed up because if they had to stop on the side of the road, you know, driving somewhere and, and do their business, they would start walking in the woods. Guys that have been there, you just did it right there because you didn't know. Right. Where you well, we're out and one day and me and him would take turns going back and forth with the GPS surveying the, the HLZs. And uh, it was his turn and he's starting to walk out there. And I'm sitting there, you know, and one of us would stay because you had a lot of especially younger 18 year late high school, college age kids that would like to start trouble and take pot shots at you still at that time. Mm-hmm. 
So one was with staying, just keep watch while the other one went out. And uh, I'm sitting there, I see him walking out. And off in the distance, I see this farmer, it looks like a farmer. And I see him, he's walking like this. He stops, turns, takes so many steps, stops, turns. And I'm like, oh man, that's a minefield. And, uh, you know, I yell out to Kirby, it's like, stop. And he's like, what? I go, stop. You go, you're in a minefield. And he's just like, what? <laughs> Oh man! Go, Can you backtrace your steps? And he's like, "Well, I think so." And then he was like, eh, "No, I don't know." And I oh. remember at Second Ranger Bat, they were like, "Hey, you want to go and learn how to look for mines?" <laughs> so I went through that training there, early '80s. You know, this is what yeah, yeah. seven nine 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 ninety eight. And I was like, "Well, okay." I got my little stick, and I'm out there with my. My knife going, whoop, whoop, whoop. Got, we, cleared oh a, we, cleared, we cleared a little path for him. And he's, oh. like, he's like, okay, I think we're done with that for now. Yeah. <laughs> he goes, yeah, oh I think we'll, we'll, we'll start looking for that. But yeah, we ended up doing that. that. That was probably the biggest thing there. We had a couple of times we were sitting in restaurants that they would come in with like baseball bats and threaten us with us. And we were in sterile. But and we carried our sidearm, our nine mils uh-huh. concealed, and basically all you had to do was kind of show it, and they, they They'd back most, off. most people would, would back off, and most people knew us yeah. by our vehicles, the, oh, the SF guys, by our vehicles, yeah, yeah. and we were one of the few groups still that we called our 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 toy bag. So in the trucks of our vehicles, that's where we kept our our long rifles and grenades and all that oh, okay. stuff. So if they usually saw us pull up and open up a trunk or the back the back of the uh, SUV, then they usually would, would, would end up backing off and, and backing oh, okay. down. Because they do a lot of stuff. They, they would go against the, the NGOs mm-hmm. sites, you know, go there and start burning their cars. And, you know, you just had stuff like that going on. But yeah, so I did that at 10th group. And then from there to uh, finished up, uh, well, my wife got promoted. She, she made senior. So, we, so we, we had the PCS and we we're trying to find a joint a joint assignment initially we were thinking europe oh let's go to europe and come yeah. tourists for but we couldn't find anything uh mike denny calls me up from uh, a- acc and goes you're going to campbell and we got your wife the position at campbell also oh nice he goes and he goes i'm going to let you know you're going there because because they just failed a major I can't remember what the inspection was. They came out with a new, you know, where they come in and inspect the squadrons. Well, Campbell yeah, felt like a readiness inspection or yeah, something. Yeah, and uh, they had they had a new name for it because I remember the thirteenth ASOF. Because when I was there, I they moved me up to the operations superintendent and then up to the squadron superintendent at okay. thirteenth. And while I was there as the squadron superintendent the last year, whatever this new inspection they had a name i can't remember the name for it. we we were like one of the first units to get it we oh, okay. got by fly, flying colors on it but camel got hit nice. with it they felled it so i was like he goes and you got to get him ready you know you got to get him back up status so i was like okay so i went to camel and uh, a lot of good guys there there was nothing wrong with the tech p guys all great guys it, yeah. a lot of it had to do with i think once we started making the squadron compound the new building because they're camel I mean, you had the, the headquarters side was in a building on this side of the post. You had the tech P guys over here on this side of the post. The weather people were on the other side of the post because at that time, weather was still, you know, in bet or part of the squadrons. Yeah, the yeah. maintenance guys were in their own little section. So everybody was just kind of like doing their own thing. So one of my first things I did was like, no, one team, one fight. And sure. I got I got everybody back together. But what I Mike didn't tell me was oh yeah by the time you get there you got 30 days to get them ready for to be (laughs) but i think everything happens for a reason i think i heard marty say that too it happens for a reason because you know in that time frame yeah we got through we got through the inspection passed past the inspection but it also got us rolling on well okay let's look at equipment let's look where 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 we at here Where, where where are we at in training where are we at in these areas and you know we got everything modernized got stuff that was supposed to been turned in years ago never got turned in like night vision goggles and all this type of stuff and i got everything back up to what we were supposed to have 
TA. Well, about that time, 9-11 happened. Oh, okay. And, <laughs> you know, that was about a year later. I, not, I think that's the last time I saw you, right? It was late. I think so, late, yeah. Late 01 or probably er, er, early 02 or something like that. But 9-11 happened. And because, I mean, honestly, at that time, I would say 25% of our M4s were not even functional. If oh, really? guys flushed out with them, they, they wouldn't have fired. Wow. And, um, and once again, I found an air, retired Air Force guy that was an offer. I was like, dude, can you fix these? He's like, yeah. <laughs> he goes, here's, here's, here's what it'll take. And I, we got him all the parts and everything. And he got everything back, oh, back, good. Back, back up again. But, uh, <laughs> and actually, because when we PCS, you know, we knew that was going to be our last assignment. Mm-hmm. And so I had to do two years there because of state side to state side. So right. September of 2001, I called up Mike and said, hey, just let you know, I'm going to be retiring. You should see my paperwork here shortly. And he was like, oh, no, no, you know, doing that whole thing. And I was like, nah, sure. I got, you know, because, you, know, you know, I got remarried and my, and my stepkids were young. And I'm like, I hadn't even seen them, you know. Yeah gone that's like i guess you know start thinking of family and so i filled out the paperwork i, I think yeah i just sent it off 9 11 happens was it two days later i think mike calls me up and goes are you tearing them up or am i tearing them up and i was like well go ahead and tear them up <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> tear them up on that so you know yeah. 9 11 kicked off we had to push out you know get, get the soft guys out on yeah. that uh and we also had a brigade hit, heading over during, during well that's that right because the fifth group guys were under the 19th essentially weren't or were yeah they, or did i mean yeah at that group? time you were still it was almost like or were they part of an ol at that time i can't remember if they were i uh, no, at that time they were still part of the squadrons okay at, at, at that it wasn't i think it was a year or two maybe after that or okay not too long after that yeah i honestly when i retired I can't remember who told me it was some senior who goes, look, you just got to get away from it. When you first retire, don't go back on base. Yeah. Don't do all this stuff. Just so I actually did that for a while. So I'm not really sure when the whole OL. It, yeah, the SF guys were kind of like, or the soft guys was kind of like second ranger bat when I was there. We were almost like, yeah, we were part of detachment six, but we were dash two. And that sure. was kind of how the soft yeah. guys kept, kept Kind of did their own thing, kind of all. Yeah, yeah I mean, compound. it was administrative. Yeah. You know, you had all your administrative done by by the squad. Kind of the same thing with the weather people. Yeah, yeah. At, at that time, so you know, pushing those guys out, and then we had one brigade after the initial, you know, takedown happened. We pushed a brigade out to uh, Afghanistan on that, and then because of my security clearance. They were like, hey, we need you to go to the uh, KAOC. Because I think Mari mentioned they had the uh, special operations element there. Yep. So I went there and did that for, what, four months? <laughs> and I was like, oh, my first Air Force. Because, <laughs> you know, we're at Prince Sultan <laughs> Air Base. Right, right, I mean, right. th- you know, this Air Force base was nicer than most most Air, Air Force bases back in the States. Yeah, yeah. And, hey, I wasn't there very long, and I was like, yeah, no, nah, this is... This is, I, I've been indoctrinated too much <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> into the other way, but in, it ended up doing that. Uh, it, it was good. I mean, it was interesting uh, doing that side. And people always ask, well, what'd you do there? I said, well, just know that on the soft side, there was somebody always watching over your shoulder, Yeah, you know, out there. And so that, that was kind of interesting, but I think, because I was watching some someone right beforehand. I know I was watching Marty's, and I know Marty was talking about, yeah, man, I wanted to get out there. I wanted to get out there. And I was the same way. I did go over yeah. once for a week. I left out of there because I was always trying to find the the, the, the colonel that was running the, the, the soft element there at the K. You know, he's like, Sergeant Ingram, I need you here. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, you know, they're kind of short over there. Look, well, I'll, I'll, I'll go. I'll go. But, <laughs> but, I mean, there was definitely a need for us to be there. Yeah, I got it. There was definitely a need because I early on, and it happened to a couple of our guys that, you know, Afghanistan was really the first time we started using GPS bombs. 
right. and having guys on the ground. And there were incidents where guys were out there and all of a sudden a 500 pound bomb just goes all right off in front of them. Because mm-hmm. with that, people are like, oh, all I need is a set of coordinates and we can strike targets. Well, nobody was coordinating yeah. who was where. Yeah, you know, for sure. Uh, on that side. And uh, and a lot of the conventional side didn't understand soft and soft operations. So, you know, you, 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 had, yep. you had to explain explain that as, as aspect to them. And I mean, there was a couple of times I got in, well, if you know me, I got in a discussion with <laughs> some of the people in charge because, you know, there was times where, you know, you get calls from Rangers and because I think at that time, I, don't, I think they were still just 60 millimeter mortars. I don't think they even gone the higher organic stuff out there. Oh, with the. Yeah, yeah. out the different, uh, you know, in Afghanistan. And I just remember one group was getting rockets shot at them from the mountainside down onto them. And there was some cloud cover. And I was like, okay, well, we got some F-16s close by. We can get them in. So I started coordinating that through our side. And then I get the guy in the crow's nest. He's like, oh, no, those guys are not dropping below 10,000 feet. They're not going down. And like I said, got in discussion with him. Luckily, the yeah. general, <laughs> once again, was an old ALO from these tasses that I knew. And he knew me. And I was like, well, we'll see about that. And I went to him and he's like, <laughs> Yeah, standby. And I also had a Marine Corps Lieutenant Colonel pilot that was like, no, we'll, we will get somebody down there. And he actually, yeah. there was a set of F-18s that were close by also. And we actually had the F-18s drop below the cloud deck and it, nice. it hit the target for them on, on that side. And there was somebody else. I don't know who it was. They just came across the radio and they said, yeah, we'll coordinate. And I was like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> on that side. So, it, you know, there was definitely a reason for it, but I wanted to get out. So I finished that up, came back. The time I got back, we were gearing up for Iraqi freedom. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, and I, at Campbell, like I said, I was the op suit slash squadron suit. Brian Peters showed up. So he, as a senior, and he took over as a squadron suit, but he just showed up, I mean, right before we were deploying. So he's like, yeah. Keith just and I knew Brian when from his time at uh, uh Fort Fort Riley and being underneath oh, okay. the six the six oh second Carson and stuff. So I I I knew Brian, so we worked well together. Oh good. You, you know, getting everybody pushed out, ended up in Kuwait and was there when Major Gray got hit. Well like uh-huh. that was that was tough trying because I mean that was the night before. I don't know if a lot of people realize yeah. that we were getting ready to go out and, and dealing with that whole aspect of it, getting everything going on, on that. Got that next day for the 101st. <laughs> and this is general Petraeus probably more than the way they operate, but the 101st, you had division main talk. You had your standard Army jump talk for division. Yeah. And then you had General Petraeus's jump talk. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I was part of General Petraeus's jump talk. So oh, I, wow. I, I was his tag along nice. with our squadron commander was there with me. So it was me and him out there. And General Petraeus was like, yep, let's, let's load up. And he had like three helicopters with, with his little <laughs> team on. And we'd, you know, just start going everywhere and anywhere that he, he wanted to go. And, yeah, so yeah. when we went across the berm, we're with his group. And as we're flying in, uh, and it goes back to the golden BB theory, as we're going in, we got shot at. One round hit the hydraulics, brought our, our Chinook down. So what? And for people that didn't know Iraq, so basically the setup was the armor guys were hitting up, hitting the roads pushing through, getting to Baghdad. That was her whole thing. Get to Baghdad as fast as you can. So any built up areas, they would bypass. And then it was the 101st and the 82nd. We would go in and clear out these towns and cities okay. where, where they're at. So we were going to jump forward. So our chopper goes down. And I think, actually, maybe it wasn't a gold beam because ours got hit 
a bullet through a hydraulics, brought ours down. Petraeus's chopper got hit. And we were spread out quite a bit. It wasn't like we all just landed. It was like, boom, boom, down we went. <laughs> well, initially, going in, the supply line from the States had not caught up yet. So we were short ammo, water, food, the whole bit. <laughs> I'm just kind of laughing now, but it wasn't that funny at the time. But so on my chopper, and I'm sitting there, I got my little Sony MP3 player cranking in one, one, one of my ear things, and we're flying on the chopper. I'm sitting next to the door gunner of, of the Chinook, and we're talking, and and we were flying over uh, some of some of the Iraqi units that were, you know, fleeing our, our armor yeah. guys coming in, and they took a couple of pot shots at it, and that's where we got hit. So we ended up going down, broke our landing struts on the the, the 47 we, we were on. So we were kind of just stuck there. Jeez. The people I had on the bird, I was the only one with a full complement of ammo. I was the only one with the radio. So basically, I ended up setting up the, the perimeter defense, got on the radio, got back to the ASOC, you know, filled them in, what was going on. You know, initially they're like, well, you're not part of the main, the main effort. I'm like, okay, do you understand what I just said? Yeah, exactly. You know, we had a sand dune where we kind of went down, it kind of went up. And after I got everybody set up, we're, we're sitting there and I'm like passing out some, some of my ammo. I didn't give them, give them much, but I was like, how many you got? Oh, I got two magazines. Sorry. Well, here, here's another one stuff and had to. The, the Chinook guys pulled their machine guns off the bird and I had them set up, set up out yeah. there. So we got, we got a perimeter set up and we're sitting out there and I'm sitting there with the Colonel and I'm like, you hear that? He's like, what? I go, I go, you hear something? And my hearing's not that great. I've been on the hearing, a hearing waiver since like 83, Yeah, <laughs> you know, stuff coming up. We basically had a, a small column of armor from the Iraqis, like one one and a half sand dunes away from it, maybe 500 meters. That no was way. back. And so I was like, oh, I'm like, okay, stand by. <laughs> you know, I was telling people if they decide to move over and come our way, you know, just, just, just be ready. But luckily, you know, they, they moved on and kind of listened and watched them, bad. watch them is going on. And then eh, maybe about an hour later, they finally brought in some other helicopters. We loaded up on them, end up going to a far for an army and feeling position that the 101st had set up. And we had a couple of our guys with them in, in case they needed them. So we ended up spending the night there and went in and ended up linking up with the jump talk, stayed with them a few days. And that's when we had this huge sandstorm that stopped the war. I mean, yeah. I heard about them, but until you are standing in the middle, cause you couldn't see anything. The sky was like a green color, but luckily the good thing about that was it allowed time for the supply to catch up. So the food, oh, water, good. ammo all cut up. So we all got back up to hunt. We actually got so much that we left mountains of MREs and cases of water just sitting in the middle of the desert because we just couldn't, couldn't take it with us. Huh. Got back. And the big thing for the 101st during that time frame was uh, the battle of Najaf and Kabbalah. And mm. my biggest, of course, I, you know, at that time I was at, at division, but my first time, because we were doing prep strikes, and I was actually going off a, U, a UAV feed, talking to the F-16. So I was sending out the talk, actually controlling from, from, from the talk, which I didn't really care for, but I was like, okay, this is maybe the new way of doing, doing some of this stuff. So sure, ended sure. up doing a lot of the, the prep fires for that. And a lot of people don't, I don't know, know that, you know, Air Force wide, we were just, you know, as far as close air support and stuff, we were just whacking once again the Iraqi army and yeah, yeah. the 101st and Jump Chase. Like, oh, our Apaches need to get into this game. So <laughs> I think it was the Jeff. No, it was Kabbalah. They're like, we want no close air support. We're going to go in with our Apaches. And they're going to do it all. Well, people saw in the news and stuff. That didn't go too well. Yeah. <laughs> Patches were just getting, because they were still using uh, uh, Cold War 
tactics. And Cold War tactics for them was, you know, they would hover below trees or behind a hill, pop up, shoot, go down, you know, armor pop up, shoot. Right. Well, they didn't take into the fact that nobody in Iraq at that time really liked us. So people were <laughs> shooting from the roofs of their building and they were just shooting Apaches out of the sky. Really? So they ended up pulling out. And I think that's where I go, you know, we locked in. It's like, are, are, are you ready for some Air Force to come in? And uh, I remember <laughs> John Petraeus. And, and I actually knew John Petraeus. So because we get our hair cut all the time together at Campbell, uh-huh. kind of linked up. And I always, so, you know, he always sit and talk to me and stuff all the time. So I had a pretty good relationship with him. And huh. uh, he'd be like, yes, I already hear bring the close air so we got the close air support in and you know we had guys on the ground controlling we actually had uh and any of the guys that listen in i forgive me i don't remember your names i only remember what i think they're one of the armor units but they broke off one of the armor companies i think yeah to support the 101st first. well nobody ever told told us okay so we just kind of find out and it's like well where are these guys at so we found out where they were at. So me and the squadron commander hop in a Hummer, go link up with them and, you know, and get them integrated. But those guys actually did a helo facking for that mission and did an outstanding oh, job. Oh, outstanding awesome. job on that. I mean, they were controlling and just taking stuff out and left and right. Yeah. And, uh, it, that's, I don't know if we even still do that or not, but, but uh, the guys, yeah, the guys did, did, did a great job on that. So we ended up taking down Kabbalah, the Jeff, and then we went up to Mosul. Breaks my heart, man. I see all this stuff years later. Uh, Mosul got taken over again. All yeah. that stuff. Because I could sit there and go, yeah, I remember that. I remember that. I remember that. So we ended up, well, we ended up going to Baghdad. Because initially, the 101st was going to air assault into Baghdad. But luckily, the armor got up there and decided that, because they were, I don't know. It was like a D-Day invasion estimate on casualties they were talking about. Yeah, I was going to say that was, that could have been bad <laughs> for that could one. So we're bad. all we're all kind of like, ooh, cool, yeah, you know, on that side. <laughs> so we ended up spending a couple of days in Baghdad. Uh, end up going up to uh, Mosul, and that's where I ended up spending the rest of my time. Uh, we basically had uh, everything from uh, Mosul north to uh, the Turkey border and and Syria border, and at that time. We started drawing down the squadron of some. I left enough to have four, five teams, you know, ETAC, a non-ETAC team. And that's how we ended up running missions. And we would send guys out. You know, I kept a, a rotate ro- rotation basis. It was fairly quiet towards the end. We were all kind of surprised that they stopped the war as soon as they did. <laughs> you know, we all knew what was going to happen six months later. Yeah, like yeah. Six, I said, no, we need to keep pushing these guys until we get them out. But, but for me, that was... You know, before all my places I've been at, even with, with you guys, you know, we went out as a team, you know, a battalion attack. But that was really my first time leading from the enlisted side, guys in a wartime environment and knowing that, you know, when I called them and said, hey, you need to go out with these guys on this mission. You need to go out with these guys on this mission that, you know, it's like, hey, man, I just told guys that they may not come home. Yeah. You know. That's why I said the gray hair, everything else started. Because <laughs> you know, I told him, it's like, yeah, before Iraq, I, my mustache was still brown. But after I got back, it ended up turning gray, gray on me. But I think that was that, yeah, that, it's that, easy that was to It's it. easy to volunteer and go out and do stuff because, you know, when you're only in charge of yourself. But, yeah, like like you were saying, like when you have to tell people to go do that stuff, that yeah. that's even worse, I think. I think I'm think i with you. I mean, that's that's harder to do than just to go out yourself, for yeah. sure. Oh, yeah. It, it, yeah. it definitely is. Yeah. So on that side, it was pretty much calm after that. Uh, just one other quick little story there to, I, hit me that when we were sitting there before, during the Battle of Kabbalah and the Jeff, we were sitting on this little, well, actually, it was flat open air before, before, we, before we got to the hilltop, but we came, the jump talk came underneath a mortar attack, not a very good mortar attack. Yeah. And I just remember people were like running and going places and the airman that was there with me, that was his, his first time. And I'm like, I'm seeing where the stuff's landing. I'm like, ah, this stuff's not, not that big of a deal. So I was like, come <laughs> with me. <laughs> so we went out and I was like, all right, start looking for a flash. This guys can't be too far out. These are not very big mortars. And, so we're standing at the berm of the jump talk that they had sitting there. And, you know, mortar rounds are coming in or 
not coming in. They, I don't think any of them actually landed inside the compound, but yeah, I was like a learning event. And so I yeah, had them out there and he training, figured out. Right. Yeah. yeah. So I had to sit there and figure out where the mortars were coming from. I go, got a coordinate. Yep. All right. Let's call it in and got it in. We had a Apache close by. They went out and, and, and uh, taking out the truck with the, the guys in the, in, in the mortar truck on there. Nice. Yeah. So yeah, <laughs> so it's like, it's always a time for a learning event. Sometimes <laughs> right, <laughs> this yeah. stuff comes up. <laughs> <laughs> it comes up on there, but uh, so yeah, that guy probably loved it, man. He, he probably that was probably he made his day that day. He got to take out a mortar position. Yeah, yeah. He thought he thought it was kind of cool. He was like, okay, that's yeah. cool. That's cool. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if he. I think he actually got out. I think he became a lawyer or something. Oh really? Came, yeah. Last I heard, but uh, but yeah, we had a couple of guys that pop hot when they uh, were testing for. Uh, chemical weapons oh really but we they didn't ever come down we were only think is because in baghdad i mean there were places where we probably knew where they kept it and guys sweep through so there's probably some residue stuff that came on the uniform oh yeah, yeah a little yeah. bit of scare we had our the other thing was we had our uh two of our weather guys were sitting at the jump talk this is after we got in after our helicopter and D Main was coming in by land. They were convoying in behind everybody. And we got asked, it's like, well, where's our weather guys? And this lieutenant's like, oh, their vehicle broke down. I think they're still out there somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> and my <laughs> our squadron commander, Colonel Mitchell, he was just like, you know, we're sitting in the division talk brief, you know, up, update brief, and he just stood up and yeah. went, What? <laughs> what do you mean? Jeez. And uh that's where it's like and after we got done, he went was talking to the command staff about it and he walks out and goes let's go we're gonna go get him i was like okay so we hop in our hummer and uh i was like well where's the other guys like where's where's our gun hummers at no we're right, going right. i go they said it's okay for us to go out by ourselves he's like oh yeah yeah i was like okay so <laughs> okay. we're cruising out with the last known position that that they were at at some point he made like well I may not have got permission. <laughs> well, after you're already out there. Yeah. yeah. So I'm like, okay. So we don't know where everybody's at. You got units that, you know, running away, trying to hide, regroup, whatever. So I just remember I found out how fast you can push a Hummer, how fast it will go across the desert. <laughs> and then we linked up with another army unit that was close by. And they're like, yeah, there's a couple of guys that dug foxholes sitting by a, a vehicle, you know, about, five five k that way and went out there and there they were they you know went through their training and they dug their little fine position next to their vehicle and was just waiting hey <laughs> so get on them picked them up <laughs> brought them back but yeah there's always a little stuff like that but you know it just it just amazed me that you know you're like yeah you can't you can't write it when it comes up. yeah exactly but uh yeah so that pretty much after that and be honest with you when we were doing clearing fires and i still remember sitting there going through the clearing of fires, you know, fire support, you know, down, down the line. And then they went, Hey, Sergeant Ingram, what? And they go, you didn't get the lawyer's permission. And I was like, what? I go, lawyers, why do I need to talk to a lawyer? Oh, we got ROE. Right. I was like, yeah, okay. That was like one of the check boxes where I was like, yeah, maybe I'm getting too old for this. It's a, yeah. a, a different era. So came back from, uh, from Iraq after I was there. What I know the, we're going to give me a short tour and i was like yeah i got enough of those don't worry about it so i ended up doing six seven months i think on that rotation came back from that hung around about another year and i was like yeah it's time you know my stepdaughter she was just starting high school during okay. nine, you know 9 11. i never saw her you know so i was like yeah this you know yeah. Yeah, got to think about the family it's a, 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 a oh for sure at some point so but, and it's not like you haven't done enough i mean you You've been busy for like your whole career. Yeah. Like, you know, yeah. Like that, sitting and around, and I mean. plus on top of that too, is ever since my last year at Carson, I have a lot of back pain and basically I was living off of Motrin. Yeah. yeah. Go off, do something. Crunch, 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 take two or three. Crunch, 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 take two or three. Yeah. And I mean, there was times in Iraq where it laid me up. I couldn't even move on my cot for like two or three days. And so my back would loosen up and I can go. And so actually after I retired and this was like, I don't know, maybe two months. Cause even my retirement physical, they didn't catch this. And I went back in at Fort Campbell and I said, look, 
I, I actually I woke up one day and I couldn't even stand up. I'd get, you know, out, out of bed. Wife took me in and they're like, well, I don't know. I don't know. And I ran across this army PA and I started telling him what it was. He's like, well, let's, let's do a MIR or yeah. And he's like, Hey, you know, you broke two of your vertebrae. What? I was like, what? He's like, yeah, you had two fractured vertebrae. And I said, it looks like it's probably been like five years because you got all this calcium oh build up. And he goes, and the calcium buildup is cutting into your muscle in, in, in your back. And I was like, no. And he's like, well, you've been in a car crash? And I was like, no. Well, well you know, motorcycle? And I was like, no. I said, I've been in a, a few helicopter crashes in, in, in my time. And he's like, oh. But I actually think it was a jump I did at Carson. Because we did a uh, 10th group was, uh, they set up an area up in the mountains, kind of like a Robin Sage training area mm-hmm. for them to do stuff with one of those small town the drop zone was at about eleven thousand feet okay and we did a static line jump and we were probably you know like twelve thousand feet <laughs> doing the static line yeah. <laughs> it was actually the air force the guard unit there at uh peterson air force base wouldn't even fly it we got the smoke oh, really? jumper guys to fly the mission for us so i think and we all came down i mean because of thin air with you know oh yeah you're smoking you in know, dash ones i think we were still jumping then and oh. i mean we had guys hit guys were walking around with concussions and i remember hurting my back i was like oh you know and i was like oh. i'm like oh, okay okay took a, i always carry my bottle of motion with me took a couple of those sure, sure. did the training exercise with them and it hurt it hurt uh went they didn't catch anything they're like, oh, well, you know, you're just getting old. I was like, okay. And, uh, yeah. So, I, so yeah, basically, I think since about 2000, that was early 2000, right before our PCS. So, I think, yeah, I walked around with that. And, I, and that, that was a big part of it, too. It's like, you know, I always said, if I can't do the mission, it's time to go. Sure. You know, um, and then, right. yeah, I was like, yeah, I, I, at that point, I, I, I was ready to retire. Because I know they wanted me to go to, I think, Fort Hood. <laughs> two of the squadrons there oh. and i was like okay let me get this right you want me to pcs the family to fort hood texas who's getting ready to deploy over to iraq which yeah, i just came no. back <laughs> yeah and i'm like exactly what's in it for me right yeah, right yeah you know, they're like yeah we figured we'd give it a shot so yeah it, it, it ended up returning oh four so 24 years one month and I was like, yeah, it's, it's time to go. And I was, I, I can tell I was, like I said, I yeah. had really nothing to do with the air force that much or the, even the military yeah. probably, except trying to get my back, which I never got in for therapy. So I actually researched online people with similar I- injuries and came up with a rehabilitation program. And I just uh, did it myself. Nice. And uh, Did it work out for you? Yeah. Yeah. I still have problems every now and then with, you know, it's, if I turn a certain way, sometimes that because when it rubbed against the muscle, the, the spine itself, I mean, it actually healed, healed itself. It never did any yeah. damage. It was the muscle is scarred. So if I don't stretch or I don't do things a certain way, it'll just knot up to that scar tissue. Oh, okay. So as long as I do that, I'm, I'm, I'm usually OK. I'm actually starting okay. to train up for a 20 mile ruck march hike competition, not competition, but event here nice coming up in a couple of months so sorry and i i still backpack i still i was actually you know back out and i what, two years ago yeah two years ago i went to the grand canyon and hiked down all and down the side of the grand canyon did all that stuff again i haven't been back to arizona nice. since, since i left you know huh. so yeah I'm, I'm, I'm still doing that type of stuff but yeah that's that's a career film in a nutshell uh you know it's what have you been doing since you got out? What, what kind of work you've been you into? Know, if you can talk about it. Yeah, I no, uh, yeah. I can't remember. I think it was last talking about the transition program in one of your uh-huh. podcasts. Yep, yep. You know, I went through the Air Force one. I think you, you mentioned something about it. I actually went through the Air Force and, and the Army one. And I remember the Air Force one was the first thing they had us do was stand up, introduce ourselves, and give the one thing that they are most worried about in retirement or separation. 
And I remember I stood up, you know, people were like, oh, job, money, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I go, boredom. All right. You know, and uh, they're like, what? I go, that's my biggest worry is boredom. Because I basically been on the go in a job where, you know, there was something happening every single day. It wasn't a whole lot of, right. you know, days where, you know, something wasn't happening and, or something different happening. That's when they always loved about the job was, you know, you're doing different yeah. things all the time. You're not just doing the same thing. Same. So, yeah. So I actually bounced around those first couple of years. I actually signed up and I did one little small stint with a security company being basically a bodyguard. Nice. Went through, got my certification to carry, you know, firearm, blah, 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 as a bodyguard. I did just one time, and I realized it's like, I ain't putting my life on the line for any of these guys. I was going to say. I mean, it yeah. was very short. I went through the training, got up. I went, was one corporate guy, it was like maybe three weeks he was deployed, or he went overseas. There was a team of like th three of us, and I just like, the whole time I was just like, nah, this is not for me. I don't know what what, what the heck I was thinking. So yeah. did that, kind of sat around, uh, ended up getting into emergency management for the state of Tennessee, run at the state level. I actually enjoyed that. I probably would have stayed in that, but at the time you were just, <laughs> maybe, maybe it was timing. Because the time I showed up, I wasn't there very long when uh, Hurricane Katrina hit. Okay. So it was like, go, 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 setting up. Because uh, we had, a, a we sent a team down to the golf area to help out there. And then we had teams back here setting up for all the displaced people to put people into. So setting all that up, okay. you know, that went on for weeks. So I had all that going on and it was basically like being in the military again, come home for two hours sleep, you know, head, head back down and, and deal, yeah. deal with all that. And plus I also learned that Tennessee has a lot of nuclear industry. Okay. You know, you got Oak Ridge, which is one of the original, <laughs> and they actually had what, what we call bat phones and they were regular telephones, you know, old style, but there was no dial, no buttons. It, they were yeah, direct yeah. Links. like a hotline. Yeah. yeah. And when those rang, you're like, Oh, and we had one there in Oak Ridge where they're like, yeah, we got a reactor. We can't get it cool. It's starting to heat up. Oh. So, you know, you got spun up doing that once again, 24 seven ops. And we yeah. actually were at almost to the point of doing the whole, what was it a 10 mile radius evacuation when they finally oh, really? got the call saying they got it under control but stuff like oh. that was happening all the time and it was just i'm like well it kind of defeats the purpose of me retiring <laughs> right. so yeah. but the whole time i was doing that i was going to school to become a i was going to become a park ranger <laughs> National okay. park service so I, I worked on my degree got that went out to mount rushmore to do my uh uh internship so I went out to Mount Rushmore in the Black Hills, did my uh, in internship there, and I realized I didn't have the patience for tourists. <laughs> but the good thing I liked about it, there, I actually resurveyed the whole boundary of Mount Rushmore because they were like, you know, we've been trying to do this for years, and we got this GPS equipment over here to do it with, survey with. And I went, well, let me go take a look at it. I'm like, okay, it's Trimble. Yeah, yeah, it's like. It's all the same concept, military yeah, GPS. Yeah. So I, I figured how to do So I actually went out and spent my time actually hiking by myself with the gear and all, nice. all, all over Mount, Mount Rushmore. Because Mount Rushmore is bigger than just where the heads are at. And, sure, and, sure. and resurveyed that, that whole area. But uh, cool. did that, realized I didn't really want to be a full-time park ranger unless they could find me a job like that, which they didn't. Yeah, yeah. And I actually got into it. I really enjoyed this. I was working with juveniles. They're, they're in the Black Hills for the state. And, uh, yeah, you know, a lot of the kids we had were drug, alcohol, petty theft type stuff. And I actually got into that. I started out what they call a wellness instructor, which basically you taught life skills and physical fitness. I ran a physical fitness cool. program. And you, you taught them because you know, a lot of these kids, you know, like one kid's like, hey, we need to get hold of your mom. Well, go into Rapid City and look on street corner or so-and-so because that's where she stands, you know, type Man. stuff. So you had to teach them just a lot of just normal life skill, you know, hygiene, Basic and, stuff, yeah. you know, everything on yeah. that side. Did that for about a year. Then I started moving up. I came to trainer for our facility 
And then I moved from that. They're like, oh, you're pretty good at that. And then I became the trainer for all the juvenile correction people in the state of South Dakota, training coordinator for that. And then for there, nice. I moved up to being a what they call an on-call supervisor. Basically, I was the guy that in the, if, while I'm there, if something was beyond any of the people in the programs for them to handle, they would call us and we'd go up and decide what, what would happen with the kids. But, oh, okay. which I enjoyed, and I probably would still be out there doing that. But one day the governor comes in at the time and pulled everybody in and goes, oh, by the way, I'm doing away with the whole division within the state of South Dakota. Jeez. So I ended up, uh, now I'm working with the, the federal government, uh, basically for the Department of Defense, doing, doing stuff for them. But okay. and I'm just finishing out. I got about a year left. Then I'm going to call it quits and we're going to head back out, nice. back, back out there. But the only reason I, I talk about all those is I know you're, I was listening to that transition that guys, I don't think really realize what skills they learn in the military. Right. You know, and I think the people, young guys listening, getting out, I mean, there's so many skills that you learn. And it's just a question. And I had to learn this is translating those skills into civilian jobs, you right. know, using the right wordage, where word, words, yep. so people know, go, Oh, that's like where I'm at now. I was like, eh. Yeah, I've, I've done some of that stuff. I've done a lot of that. And I put in, they called me up, went, did an interview, and they're like, you're hired. And I'm like, and we'll start you at this level, higher than a, I was like, oh, okay, that's cool. And <laughs> I actually told them, they're like, well, you got to, you know, there's a lot of stuff that, you know, skills that it takes other people years to learn, you know, right. coming in here straight out of college or whatever. But it was a little intimidating because, I mean, I was sitting in rooms with people with, you know, doctorate degrees from MIT and all these different places. And I'm like, Oh man, what did I get myself into, man? And, right. you know, Parks and Rec's degree. <laughs> you, know, <laughs> and Rec. you know, anything that didn't have to deal with math, I, I, I stayed away from it, but sure, yeah, sure. people out there, I mean, from, you know, the jobs I did, emergency management, even working with juveniles, just, you know, how to approach people and yeah. deal with them and, and understand that. I mean, be honest with you, some of the stuff I did with them is like, well, if I had a new airman come in, how do I want to integrate them into this program? You know, and I kind of took that approach. I actually used the Air Force training program to revamp the whole oh, yeah. training system. <laughs> yeah. Smart. Because yeah. at the time when I took it over, we had a turnover rate in staff of almost 75 to 80 percent. Because people oh, would come okay. into that and think, oh, yeah, because it. For a state job in that area, it paid like really well. Yeah. So people saw the paycheck, but they didn't realize what they were getting into. Yeah. And being short, the program staff leadership would be like, they would just throw people into it. So I actually came up with a whole new training program to get them trained up. And I also came up with like an on the job training program, which I set up like the Air oh, Force. Nice. Sign off on here. You're going to, you know, they're going to do this. And, and we went from, a 75, 80% turnover rate down to about 15, 20%. Nice. Turnover rate. Yeah. It's amazing when you give, when you actually give them the skills and they, they you empower them to do their job, like they want to stick around and do it. You know, yeah. I guess if you, yeah, yeah and, that's awesome. You know, a big thing for guys to take too is, you know, Air Force and especially our type of job teaches critical thinking and right. people in the civilian world, they are just dying for people. They can sit there and look at something and go, okay, well, let's take a look at it. Let's work through this. How can we get from point A to point B? Right. You know, on that side. So, yeah. I, and I, I, I think in our career field, even more so than some other, because I talked to other people from other, you know, retired or got out and they're, they're doing where, where I'm working at. And they're like, where'd you learn that? I go, well, you know, I did this additional duty. I did this, you know, I was in charge yeah. of this. And, you know, when I was at this one, you know, I had to learn what all the other positions did. And they're like, oh, right. yeah, I was, I was just a maintainer. I just, you know, I worked on planes the whole time or I you know, did this yeah. one job the whole time. So especially in our type of genre, I think there's just so many skills that you learn. So don't be afraid. Tell right. people, go out there and you think, well, yeah, maybe I can do that because you'll probably find that you can and you're probably better than a lot, a lot of other people out there. So, you know, for sure. Just, and like I said, big thing is take some writing classes, maybe on just how to wordsmith. 
you know, a, a resume. How to, how to translate that yeah. those skills to, you know, yeah. what the civilians want to hear. Yeah. Yeah. You know, trying because I said that was, because I was putting in for, I don't know. I mean, to be honest with you, I had no clue what I wanted to do when I retired. Because all, you know, for me, it was the military. And I, people that know me and been around me, I was probably to the overboard, but it was just mission, 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 mission. You know, that, that was me. So I didn't really think about the outside world that much until, you know, bam, oh, shoot, I mean, how long? Is it time to go? Is yeah. it time, time to stay? Oh, it's time. You know, <laughs> time to go, time, time to stay. You know, what, what I want, you know, want to do in life. But, yeah. So, yeah, that's about it in a nutshell. And like I mentioned earlier, I'm starting to get into elderly care awareness uh, with that because of my mom. And, uh, mm-hmm. and not just my mom. I actually talked to other people. And it's like, you know, my parents have good health insurance, but they can't yeah. get the care. Is it a lack of people or is it like just it's a lack of, or? I'll be honest with you. It's a lack of, well, you know, if we go and do this and we spend this or the insurance company go, well, you know, if you look at average lifespan, you're close to the end. So is it really worth us paying for you to prove this? Oh, okay. You know, that's part of it. And the other part, I think. So they're trying to they're trying to like stonewall them or trying to stall until, <clears throat> God forbid, they pass away. Yeah. And then they don't have to worry about it. Yeah. And it's just and some of it's just attitude. It's just like, well, you know, you lived a good life. You know, do you really need this? You know, do you really need this Man. stuff? You know, we've heard that. Uh, wow. You know, and not just me, because my uh, wife's mother passed away not too long ago and going through her, you know, get her trying to get her treatment and stuff. It was just. You know, people just kind of blow it off. And some of it is just not enough people that yeah. are, are doing elderly care nowadays. You know, I'd be like, oh, yeah, we'll get your appointment. But it may be six months away. And within that six months, they end up passing away because, you know, they didn't Jeez. catch. You know, my father had cancer. They didn't catch it. The only reason they caught it. He was at an emergency room. Another doctor was walking by where he was at in the emergency room, overheard the conversation. He goes, do you mind if I take a look at him? Went up, looked at him, did a couple things with him. He goes, he's got cancer. Go, go do x-rays just to double check, you know? What? And by the time they found it, it was too late. He, he died within oh, three, three, three days, I think of that. But you know, he's been cl- complaining for years, you know, something wasn't right. And they just, Oh, well, Oh, well, Oh, well, you know, so, that's something that we're, we're, we're starting to get into. Uh, you know, it's just like, you know, my mom had her, her long-term skills facility she's at now because she has dementia and we just couldn't, couldn't take care of her at home anymore. You know, it's a lot of things like, well, what's the policy on this? Yeah. You know, how many staff are you supposed to have on here? Right. You know, they tell you, and I look it up, like here in Missouri, the staff to resident ratio is based on emergencies as in, Oh, if there's a fire, how many staff does it take to get them everybody out, out of the building? It's not based okay. on care. Oh, okay. So that's one thing we're working now. And like I said, my wife actually talked to one of our state representatives that, you know, we're trying to get them to highlight that. It's like, you need to change this policy. You know, it yeah. needs to be based on. Because I bet that number would be lower. You know, it only takes a couple of guys to get everybody out, but. To, to actually care for these people appropriately, you need way more people than yeah, the staff. Yeah, and the way it is now, it's just not your medical staff. When it comes to that, that can be the maintenance people, custodian people, people that work the front office. Oh, yeah, we got all these people here. So even still, you don't have that that ratio of, you know, trained medical people care. Oh, okay. You know, at these facilities, because when they look at that, it's just like, well, who works for this facility and is in this building at that time? Oh, okay. Because, you know, on the juvenile side, and because they're juveniles, there was always mandated either federal or state level staffing. And right. that's where I'm kind of comparing it to trying to get people in, at least in Missouri right now, to look at that as like, you know, here it was, we had a one to eight ratio, one staff to eight youth, but that is based on care, treatment, you know, security, the whole bet because the place I worked at, we didn't have fences or any of that type of stuff oh, okay. on it. So it wasn't like a juvenile prison by any means. It was, a you know, we had a high school and a middle school and 
Oh, okay. They, they were building houses and, you know, we had a trade school side of the house to it. Oh, nice. Yeah. Yeah. It was actually a, a pretty good deal. We were shocked that they closed it down, but, but yeah, so that's, yeah. that's where we're at as far as us right now is definitely on the elderly side of the care. And of course I looked there and go, well, it's not like we're getting any younger. <laughs> so you know, <laughs> it's almost like you're helping them and helping. Them. Oh yeah. I, I mean, like at some point we're all going to get old, you know, I didn't always have yeah, that, yeah. have a gray, a, a gray mustache and I actually had hair, which I'm jealous by the way. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Still got all your hair in this. Still I'm getting a little gray though, right here in the beard. So it's, I'm getting, yeah. it's coming around for me. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, but that's about it. I, unless there's something else. Well, you think I, I this missed. is awesome. I, I, yeah, I, I can't thank you enough for doing this. I really appreciate it. I mean, this is fascinating. And, um, I, 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 I was able to, you know, you were able to mention me for a little bit, but it's nice to hear the rest that what, what you did after the, after we parted ways. And yeah. yeah, it's really cool. And again, I can't thank you enough for what you did for me. And, you know, you were integral in, in, uh, my successes. So I appreciate it. Well, they put you on the right foot, but you did it all yourself. I saw it in you. I'll, I'll put a plug for you. I, I, I saw it in you the day, you know, within a, a couple of weeks of you showing up. I'm like, this, this guy's going to do all right. This guy's oh, going to do I all right. I appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs> this group. I, well, you, and you don't have to show. You can you can uh, cut this out of it. But I don't know if you remember. We set up. We recalled you guys in one day and said there was like some terrorist organization down in Peru or something. And we were all getting ready to go. And we actually had people calling in. This is what this is before we even we yeah, I still think had I the old this, yeah. the first building there where the old Glickham was at. And right, right. we had you guys going. I remember you were like Oh, I you were like I yeah, baby. It. Well, you all did, and we were like, <laughs> All right, stand down. And I saw the disappointment in your eyes yeah. that I was like, Yeah, this guy, he's he's gonna <laughs> he's gonna fit in. He's gonna do yeah. That was a, really well. I thought for sure we were going. I thought I, I was like, this is but, it, because you you guys had, had talked about Panama and you know and all that stuff, and I was like, and I was you know you know how you are when you're young, yeah. you want to get after it, so yeah. yeah. But, but, but <laughs> at at, the, at that point, I said, yeah, this guy's gonna do. He's he's gonna do some great things. Well, I appreciate it. That's nice for you to yeah. say. Well, yeah, it's good seeing you. Yeah, good seeing you too. All right. Well, hey, I appreciate it. Okay. Thanks again for doing this. I, it was really good catching up, and uh, I appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Well, you have a good day. I'll let you go. You probably got stuff to do. Yep. All right. Uh, it's like, again, good talking to yeah. you, and uh, yeah, I'll keep in touch, yeah, and uh, thanks again. I appreciate it. All right. Have a good day. All right. Okay. See you later. All right. Bye. Bye.